what's up students welcome back to my channel in this video i'm going to solve the complete 13 questions of the 2020 mathematics YEG. so as usual just follow along if you have any question or any subject you want me to create a video on it drop it in the comment box down below as usual you you are aware that the exam into two sections the section one you are supposed to there's the first five questions you're supposed to answer all the questions while the remaining part there's a section b you have to select five questions right out of eight so all in all you're answering 10 questions so just follow step by step in case you are lost you can pause the video and watch again so in this case let's give it a word All right, our very first question is question 1A. And the question says, if A is a set of multiples of 2, B the set of multiples of 3, and C the factors of 6 are subset of a universal set which ranges from 1 to 10. So, now one thing you should note here is that this less or equal to 1 is trying to tell us that one is involved but if it was only less than one then we're not going to include one we're going to start from two and so also this 10 is less or equal to 10 that means 10 is involved if it was just less than then we're going to stop at nine so the question says we should find a complement or a prime intersect b complement intersect c complement so remember that our universal set which is always represented like this is equal to start from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, right? And the question says we should find A complement in the set, B complement in the set, C complement. So, what I want to do, the first thing to do is to find these subsets we're going to find a the elements in a b and c then after getting those elements then we'll find the complement of those subsets then we'll be able to find what intersect them that means what they have in common so now let's go let's find a complement let's find the element in a so a so a remember that a is what the multiple of two so we are going to find the multiple of two that ranges from one to ten right in this universal set what are the multiples of two within one to ten so we know the multiple of two two is the first followed by four then six then eight and ten you have to stop here because our universal set stop at ten then the next thing is to find the elements in B, the elements of set B, and remember that set B is multiples of 3, right? So multiple of 3, we know is 3, then 3 plus 3 is 6, 3 plus 6 is 9. So these are the multiple of 3, right? Within 1, 2, 10. Then the next thing is factors of 6, right? That's C so c is factors of six and the factors of six of course we know that one is a universal factor so one is a factor and what is the meaning of factor of six all those numbers that six can divide by them without any remainder but remember that six divided by one is six then six can go into two because six divided by two is three so two three can go because six divided by three is two and finally six because six divided by six is one so these are the factors of six from ranging from one to ten these are the factors of six so the next thing is to find the complement of these sets right so i'll write them beside each other so the complement of a what is the meaning of complement or prime it means all the set found in universal set that are not present in that set so now in this case we're going to find all we are going to look at all those sets that are found in this universal set that are not present here they are called complement so what are those numbers that are 
found in this universal set that are not found here. So let's check them. Do we have one in universal set? Yes, but is there one in A? No. So one is a prime or one is a complement. Then is there two universal set? Yes. Or is there two in A? Yes. So then three universal set. But is there three in A? No. So three is a complement. Can you see? Five universal set? Yes. But five in A? No. So five is a complement. Six universal set? Yes. Six in A? Yes. See it here. Seven universal set? Yes. Seven in A? No. So seven is here. Eight universal set? Yes. Eight in A? Yes, so it's not a complement. Nine universal set, yes. Nine in A, no. So nine is a complement. Ten universal set, yes. Ten in A, yes. So these are the complement of A. These are all the complement of A. The elements found in the universal set but not found in A. So let's see B complement. B complement all the sets found in the universal set but are not found in B. Of course, we know 1 is in the universal set but B doesn't have 1. So we have 2, yes, because there's no 2 in B, but there is 3, right? Because there's universal, 3 universal set. Then 4, yes, it's a complement because 4 is not found in B. 5, yes, 6, no, 6 is found in B, right? 7, Yes, eight. Yes, what of nine? Nine is found in B. Then we have ten. Then what about C complement? So C complement or C prime. What are those elements found in universal set that are not found in C? We have one is found in C, so one is not there. Two is found. Three can be found in C. Then four is not in C. Five is not in C. 6 is in C, see here, then 7 is not in C, then 8, 9, and 10. So these are the complements of this set. So now the question says we will find the complement of A intersect, complement of B intersect, complement of C. Now what is the meaning of this intersect? So indirectly, this is trying to tell us to find what all these elements or all these sets have in common right so now what we can do is step by step by finding the intersect of complement a and b first so let's find a complement intersect b complement so what join complement of a and complement of b of course we have one and one so one is a complement so what they have in common again yeah we have five and five right so five is intersecting them they have five in common then what again they have in common they have seven and seven remember it's only a and b now so we have seven is there any other one that's all that's what a and b have a complement B complement has in common. So now is to get A complement, that's this, and C complement. Right? So if we do that, we're going to have A complement, B complement, now intersect C complement. So what is intersecting this one and this C complement? What they have in common? So let's check them. Do they have anything in common? Of course, yes, they have five in common. So five. And they have seven in common. So these are the two elements they have in common. So A complement B comp intersect B complement intersect C complement is five and seven. So let's move to the next question. Alright. Question one B it says that. Tickets for a movie premiere cost $18.5 each, while the bulk purchase price for five tickets is $80. If four gentlemen decide to get a fifth person to join them so that they can share the bulk purchase price equally, how much would each person save? So now, remember that 
the movie premiere costs eighteen dollars, eighteen point five dollars each. That's eighteen dollars fifty cent. But if it is bulk, that is, it must made up of five individuals. They're going to pay eighty dollars. Is that not? So now, for us to know how much these five people will have to contribute to make it up to eighty dollars. We have to divide that eighty dollars by the number of individuals. That's five. So we'll be able to know how much they are going to contribute. Then we'll compare it with the movie premiere cost for each. So now remember that the the premiere cost is eighty point five dollars. So so we're going to say premiere cost is what. Eighteen dollars fifty cents, right? Then we said bulk ticket, right? Bulk ticket for five is equals to eighty dollars. Now, as we said, to know the cost of bulk ticket for each person, right? How much they're going to contribute? We're going to say that eighty dollars divided by the number of persons that's five so we said cost of bulk ticket per person is going to be they are eighty dollars divided by the number of the individual which is five and eighty divided by five is going to give us sixteen so it's actually sixteen dollars that's per person right Right, so now how are we going to know the amount each of them will save? Of course, it's very simple. By the time we subtract these sixteen dollars from this eighteen point five zero dollars, we're going to know how much each person is going to save. So then, for the for then for those four people to go and pay eighteen point five dollars each, it's better for them to look for an individual so that they'll pay for eighty dollars. To save some cash, so how much are they going to save? So we're going to say now amount saved, amount saved each is going to be what? It's going to be eighteen point five zero minus sixteen dollars. So eighteen point five zero is actually going to be two point five zero dollars. So it's going to be two point five zero dollars so this is the amount each person will save if they will go for the bulk ticket but if they're going to if they're going to go for a premium cost of course they will not be able to save this 2.5 dollars so that is the amount they're going to save per person next question all right question two question two a says that given that P is equal to RK over Q minus MS all to the power of 2 over 3. Right? So the first question says we should make Q the subject of the relation. We should make the Q the subject of the relation. So now if we're going to make Q the subject formula, now we're indirectly going to make Q to sound on its own. So how are we going to do? Remember we have P over P is equal to into rk over q right minus ms into 2 over 3 so the first thing to do is we have to get a means to remove this power and how we're going to remove this power is very simple just take the opposite of this power how by the time we know this is 2 over 3 just multiply it all through by the power of 3 over 2 3 over 2 just turn the fraction upside down so i multiply both sides by that power right so now we're going to multiply multiply both sides by the power of 3 over 2 so you say so if we're going to multiply both sides by the power of 3 over 2 of course you know that p now will have what 
p raised to the power 3 over 2 right is equals to open bracket r k over q minus m s to the power of 2 over 3 now multiply by 3 over 2 now if we do that we know that 2 will cancel this 2 1 and 3 will cancel this 3 and we can see we've successfully removed the power now p to the power of 3 over 2 is equals to r k over q minus m s balance this one with one you can balance it so now in this case since we are trying to make q the subject formula we can move this minus m s to the other side so that it will become plus once it turns to the other side of the equality sign it's going to change to plus because it is minus in this case so now in this case we're going to have so in this case if we take it to the other side we're going to have p raised to 3 over 2 now it's going to be plus ms is equals to rk over q right you can see we've successfully moved the ms to the other side and that's changed to plus so now what are we going to do we can balance this one with what one and with one so right all of them will be fraction so since the denominators are the same we can just add the numerators right so the same thing as p to the power of 3 over 2 plus ms now they will have the same denominator 1 this equals to rk over q so now whenever you have equal sign between fractions what i'm going to do is if there's only two fractions you can cross multiply uh, if we cross multiply we're going to have q will multiply by this q will multiply by entire this entire numbers or this entire part so we're going to have we're going to have q into because we're going to multiply all through q into p to the power of 3 over 2 plus m s right it now equals to r k can you see because r k is going to multiply by 1 so now remember we're looking for we're trying to make q the subject formula so if we're going to make q the subject formula we can say divide both sides by what divide both side by p cube p to the power of 3 over 2 plus ms by the time we divide both sides by it, we're going to have something like this q into p 3 raised to the power 2 plus ms is equal to rk so divide both sides by that you divide both sides by p raised to the power 3 over 2 plus ms the same thing p raised to the power 3 over 2 plus ms right if you divide both sides by that you know that this will go with this you are left with only q right so now we're going to have q is equal to rk over p to the power of 3 over 2 plus ms so this is actually the subject formula making q the subject formula but we're not true the question says find correct to two decimal places the value of q when p now p is equals to 3 m is equals to 15 s is equals to 0 0.2 k is equals to 4 and r is equals to 10 so we're going to substitute it into this equation that we've gotten right so let's do that so of course we're going to substitute it we know that we're going to have q is equals to what is our r our r is 10 right 10 times our k which is what 4 over what is our p our p has been given as what 3 right so we have 3 to the power of to the power of 3 over 2 right because this is having 3 over 2 then we have plus m which is 15 
times s which is 0 0.2 right so if we do that we're going to have something like this 10 times is 4 is 40 over 3 to the power of 3 over 2 plus 15 plus 0 15 times 0 0.2 15 times 0 0.2 is 3 right so we have 3 Oops. 3 so now this is same thing as 40 over using a lot of indices we know that this one here is the root and this is the power right so if that's the case we're going to have the square root of 3 to the power of 3 then we have plus 3 so which is same thing as 40 over what's the square root of 3 the square root of 3 is 1.7 then to the power of 3 so 1.732 1.732 remember we still having the what cube right we just this one we've just taken the square root then we have plus 3 now this is going to be equals to 40 over 1.732 cube so let's see shift cube what's the answer 5.19 5.196 so we're going to say remember plus th uh, 3 right plus 3 so we're going to have 40 over at the answer plus 3 plus 3 is 8.196 so we're going to have 8.196 so 40 divided by 8.196 40 divided by 8.196 the answer is 4.880 remember the question said we should leave our answer in two decimal places so it's going to be 4.88 so it's close to 4.88 so in two decimal places right in two decimal places so this is the answer so let's move to the next question all right number 2b says given that x plus 2y over 5 is equals to x minus 2y we have to find x to ratio y so in this case now we know that we have x plus 2y over 5 is equals to x minus 2y then you balance this one with 1 right so what we're going to do since there is equality sign between these two fractions we cross multiply if we cross multiply of course we are going to have 5 we will multiply all through this right so 5 into x minus 2y is equals to this one multiply by 1 right so x plus 2y so now I put in this bracket this 5 multiply by this and it's going to multiply by this it's going to have 5x minus 10y is equals to x plus 2y all right so collecting items x should move to one side y y should move to one side of course we're going to have 5x now this x will move to the other side we're going to be minus right so we're going to have minus x is equals to 2y this minus y will move to the other side it's going to be what plus 10y we say plus 10 y so now 5x minus x that's just like 5 sheep minus a sheep it's going to give us 4 sheep right so this one is going to be 4x is equal to 2y plus 10y is going to be 12y so from here we can conclude because the question say we should find what x to ratio y and what's the meaning of x to ratio y this means x over y right so if that's the case we've gotten our x and we've gotten our y so 
indirectly this is trying to tell us that we have 4x over 12y so which is same thing as 4 here is 1 4 here is 3 we same thing as x over 3y right so now in this case x over 3y which is equals to same thing as 1 to ratio 3 because this is equation of x here is 1 and the equation of y here is 3 so is 1 to ratio 3 that is the answer so let's move to the next question all right question 3a the question says that in the diagram o is the center of the cycle a b c d e so this is the center of the cycle now line b c right which is from here to here is is equal to line c d that's why you can see these two stru two strokes here it's trying to tell you that these sides are equal so whenever you see strokes like this it's trying to tell you the sides are equal and angle b c d is equal to 108 degrees so that means the angle is located on this c always the alphabet at the center carries the angle so this is the angle right so angle b c d is equals 108 but that we should find angle c d e so angle c d e so we have to find this this is angle c d e so the angle will be located at the middle letter so angle c d e so we want to find that so how are we going to do the first thing to do is to check what we have available of course in cyclic geometry there are so many ways of getting the answer but it's more preferable to always go with the shortest one and remember that whatsoever step you write you must have to give a theory because it's a cyclic theory it's a theory you have to give the theory that will back up what you said so the first thing to do i think it will be better if we add a little construction which will make our work easier we have something like this So, by the time we construct something like this, it will be much more easier. Why? Because this angle here and this angle here will be equal. Since the sides are equal, it will give us uh, an isosceles triangle. An isosceles triangle, remember the base of an isosceles triangle are always equal. So, now we can just name this one to be small letter A. And this one too will be small letter a of course because they are equal so since we have something like that we can we can get those sides because getting those angles actually will help us to get what we want so we can say that a plus a plus this 108 108 degrees 108 degrees is equal to what is equal to 180y because sum of angles in a triangle is equals to on is equals 180 and remember one of the theory is that the base of an isosceles triangle are equal so we're going to write all the the, the statement here we said sum of angles in uh this is another short form of writing a triangle of angle in a triangle is 180 degrees and we can also add that base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal so with that now we know that we have a plus a will give us 2a right so we have 2a plus 108 is equal to 180 degrees so correct light times we're going to have 2a is equal to 180 degrees minus 108 remember that this one will move to the other side right so this one will be 2a is equal to 180 degrees minus 108 degrees is actually 72 right so we have 72 so we divide both sides by 2 2 so these two cancel these two and 72 divided by 2 is 36. 
so 2 here is 1 2 here is 36 so we have that our a is equal to 36 degrees right so we've gotten our small small a's so if we've gotten our small a's it's very easier for us to get the main one remember that if you have an angle like this do you know that this is from here to here is 90 degrees yes of course because angle in a semicircle is always 90 degrees so if you have something like this like this remember the line cut across the center right this is the center if we have an angle like this this one will be 90 degrees even if we have something like this this place will be 90 degrees why right? because 90 degrees right so so angle and angle subsent at the at the circumference uh, is a semicircle of course it's going to be 90 degrees so now as a, since it is so we can get this place right since we are looking for the entire angle here after getting this we're going to add it to this a that we've gotten right so let's do that so now we're going to say this angle is what 90 degrees so let's name it uh, b b is cos 90 degrees and we'll, so that we'll be able to write the reason we said b is 90 degrees why we say that angles in a semicircle is 90 since this place is 90 degrees and we already know that this one here this small a here is 36 degrees because all the small small a's are 36 degrees we've calculated them so how can we get the entire angle from here this angle is so simply by saying what 90 plus 36 degrees right so the sum of angle there so we we'll say that angle c d e is equal to 90 plus 36 right? 90 plus 36 would be 90 plus 36 90 plus 36 so 90 plus 36 is 126 degrees so we're going to have 126 degrees so this is our angle c d e very simple right so let's move to the next question all right next question says that given that tan x is equals to the root of 3 where x ranges from 0 to 90 degrees we are to evaluate cos x squared minus sin x all over sin x squared plus cos x so from this question now this is actually a very very simple question but you need to understand one thing remember that we have that x is given as root 3 right and this value of x ranges from 0 to 90 0 to 90 So since it's 0 to 90, now if you check our angles, what type of angle ranges from 0 to 90? Of course, it's just a right angle triangle because right angle triangle is actually 0 to 90. So indirectly, the question is trying to tell us that this is something as root 3 over 1, right? Remember that we have is tan x, right? Tan x. So now if you draw the right angle triangle, so if we draw the right angle triangle, of course, tan x. What's the meaning of tan x? Using our socatua, which means that sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, right? So sine equals to opposite over hypotenuse, all right? In short, then we have cos is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, and tan is equal to opposite over adjacent. All over adjacent can you see so now with this we will be able to know what is this tan x Remember, because tan x is given as root 3 now we balance it with 1 which is root 3 over 1 and what is tan trigonometric ratio tan is opposite all over adjacent so it's trying to tell us that this is our opposite and this is our adjacent root 3 is our opposite and 1 is our adjacent so what is where is our opposite uh, of course our opposite is here which is now root 3 right then our adjacent is going to be 1 remember the question says we should find cos x 
right so now it is not possible for us to get this cos x right because cos x is adjacent all of our hypotenuse and we don't have our hypotenuse so what are we going to do we have to calculate the hypotenuse here so let's make it x here if we make the hypotenuse x so how are we going to calculate it using the Pythagoras theory and the Pythagoras rule says that the square of our hypotenuse we have hypotenuse square is equal to opposite square plus adjacent square right so now what is our hypotenuse our hypotenuse is x right so it's going to be x square this cos what is our opposite our opposite is root 3 so root 3 square plus our adjacent which is 1 square so this is going to be x square is cos what is root 3 square root 3 square is going to be root 9 because it's same as root 3 times root 3 which is root 9 plus then 1 square is actually 1 right because 1 times 1 is 1 so this is going to be x square is equal to what is the square root of 9 is actually 3 right then plus 1 so we have x square is going to be 3 plus 1 is 4 so take the square root of both sides both sides right in short so take the square root of both sides because we want to remove the square the square we want to remove the square we're looking for x not x square so this square will cancel this square root we're left with x because what is the square root of 4 is actually 2 so our hypotenuse is actually what 2 so getting the hypotenuse now will help us to find our cos because the question says we should find cos x square minus sine x all of our sine x square plus cos x so now substituting it into this right we're going to have what is our cos x square cos x of course cos x is adjacent of the hypotenuse so cos now is going to be adjacent of hypotenuse and what is our adjacent our adjacent is 1 so we have 1 over hypotenuse which is 2 remember is square why because here we have square then we have minus sine x and sine x is going to be sine is opposite of hypotenuse and our, our opposite is root 3 while our hypotenuse is 2 so we're going to have root 3 over 2 because it's opposite of hypotenuse so root 3 over 2 then over right remember because this is the numerator sine x square what is sine x of course sine is opposite of hypotenuse so it's going to be root 3 over hypotenuse which is 2 right square because the sine is having square so then plus cos x now what is our cos x we say cos x is adjacent over hypotenuse and our adjacent is 1 all over hypotenuse is 2 so this is what we're going to do then the best thing to do is to solve this our question into our numerator and denominator and the later on we'll join them right so if we're going to solve it like that so our numerator now let's bring our numerator our numerator now is going to be this square of course we know that it's for all of them so we're going to shade it it's going to be one square all over two square remember it's only the numerator will be minus root 3 over 2 right so now this one is going to be 1 square is 1 over 2 square is 4 minus root 3 over 2 so what we're going to do we'll find the LCM right remember that all this one is the numerator so what's the LCM of 4 and 2 is 4 so we're going to say 4 divided by 4 is 1 and 1 times is 1 is 1 so we have 1 minus we have 4 divided by 2 is 2 and 2 times root 3 is 2 root 3 2 root 3 so this is uh, the answer to our numerator so let's solve the denominator so we we'll say denominator so denominator now uh, remember that this is our denominator right so we're going to solve it individually we have root 3 all over 2 square and what is root 3 square we're going to share this square to both the numerator and denominator we're going to have root 3 square over 2 square right then we have plus 1 over 2 so this is same thing as what root 3 square is going to be root 9 over 
2 square is 4. Then we have plus 1 over 2. So in this case now, what is root 9? Root 9 is actually 3, right? So we have 3 over 4 plus 1 over 2. So we'll take the LCM also. The LCM here is going to be 4. So 4 divided by 4 is 1. And 1 times is 3 is 3. Then we have plus 4 divided by 2 is 2. And 2 times is 1 is 2. Right? So this is going to be 3 plus 2 is 5. 5 over 4. So this is actually our denominator. So now I'm bringing the numerator and the denominator together. We you know our numerator, the answer was what? this right so we're going to have 1 minus 2 root 3 over 4 right then divide by our denominator now is what 5 over 4 so what i'm going to do of course whenever we have division between fractions we take reciprocal right take reciprocal and you take reciprocal the second fraction will turn upside down and the division will turn into multiplication. We're going to have 1 minus 2 root 3 over 4 times 4 over 5. Of course, this 4 will cancel this 4, right? So we are left with equals to 1 minus 2 root 3 over because this is 1 and this is 1. 1 times 5 is 5. So this is actually the value of the value of cos x squared minus sine x all over sine x squared plus cos x. Let's move to the next question. All right, question four. The question says that the total surface area of a cone of slant height l centimeters and base radius r centimeters is 224 pi centimeter square. If r to ratio l, that is the radius to ratio the slant height is 2 to ratio 5. We should find A correct to one decimal place the value of R, that's the radius, and B correct to the nearest whole number, the volume of the cone, taking pi equals to 22 over 7. So from this question, we know that the total surface area has been given. We have total surface area has been given as 224 five right then we were given that r to ratio l is two to ratio five what's the meaning of this this is actually trying to say you know the ratio is sometimes divided by so it's something i said r divided by l is equals to two to divide by five so now the best thing to do here is we have to find the value of either r or l then we'll substitute into the formula of the total surface area of that cone then we'll be able to get our unknowns so how can we get the value of r or l is just by cross multiplying this we cross multiply this by this we're going to have an equation r times 5 is 5r is equal to 2 times l is 2l so let's find let's make l the subject formula making l the subject formula will divide both sides by what 2 right so we have 2 2 this will cancel this. Now we are left with L is equals to 5R over 2. So now we have this. Now what is the formula for the total surface area of a cone? It would be nice for us to see, to know the nature of a cone. Then from there we will know the total surface area. So now this is a typical uh, example of a cone where this height is known as the slant height slant height and it's always signified L then we have then we have the normal height here which is always represented with H and this is the radius of the base now the question is what is the area total surface area of this shape now this curved surface is given as the area is given as pi R L while this circular base, of course, the circle, the total surface area is given as pi r squared. So, we want to get the total surface area of this is going to be 
the summation of the curve surface plus that of the circular base. So it's going to be phi r l plus phi r square. So now the next thing to do is to check how can we factor out this because we want to substitute this l into the equation, right? So if you check, they have r pi r pi r in common. So you can factor out pi r. So we know that the total surface area now is going to be pi r into l plus r why because pi r times l is going to give us pi r l and pi r times r is going to give us pi r squared so doing that now we can substitute it everything into our equation we know that total surface area has been given us 224 Pi. So we're going to say 224 pi is equals to pi r into what is our l? Our l we've gotten it as 2 5 r divided by 2. So we have 5 r over 2 plus r. Can you see? So now in this case, we know that. This pi can cancel this pi, right? So we'll be left with 2, 2, 4 is equal to, so we're going to have 2, 2, 4 r, because the pi is gone now, into 5 r over 2 plus r over 1 bracket. So now the next thing to do is to take the LCM of those in the bracket, because we're going to do in the bracket first. So taking the LCM is 2. 2 into 2 is 1, and 1 times 5r is 5r, plus 2 into 1 is 2, 2 times r is 2r. So now in this case, we're going to have 2, 2, 4 is equal to r, balance it with 1, then we have times, because this bracket means times, right? So 5r plus 2r, of course, is 7r, so we have 7r over 2, right? So now... So the next thing we're going to have is 2, 2, 4 is equal to r times 7, right? Is 7r squared over 1 times 2 is 2. So balance this one with 1. So what we're going to do next, remember we are trying to find the r, right? So we'll cross multiply. If we cross multiply, we're going to have 7r squared is equal to 2, 2, 4 times 2. So this one is going to be 7r square equals to 224 times 2. It's equals to 448. So we're going to have 448. So what we're going to do in order to find our r, we divide both sides by 7. So if we divide both sides by 7, we're going to have 7r square is equal to 4, 4, 8, divided by, by 7. This 7 will cancel this 7, right? So 4, 4, 8, divided by 7. Divided by 7 is 64. So we have 64. R square is equal to 64. So remember we're looking for R, not R square. So we'll take the square of both sides. So so if you take the square of both sides, we're going to have something like this. These two cancel this square root, right? So we're going to have r is equal to what's the square of 64? Well, the square of 64 is actually 8. So we have 8 centimeters. So this is our radius. We've gotten our radius. Remember the first question says we should find what? Our first question says we should find correct one decimal place the value of r. And the value of r is actually 8 centimeters. So the next question says, correct to the nearest whole number, we should find the volume of the cone. So b now, we're going to say b. The volume of cone. So now, the form, what is the formula for finding the volume of a cone? So the volume of a cone is given by volume is equals to 1 over 3 pi r square h 
pi r square hertz so now the question is we have pi we have r right but do we have h no so how are we going to find our h we can find our h from the diagram here let's check it from this diagram now it has actually formed it has actually formed a right angle triangle something like this something like this right where this is the h then this is the l the slant r, and this is the r right so now we have already gotten our r but we haven't gotten our h and our l so how can we get our l getting our l is actually very very easy if we go back to if we go back to this equation we can get our l right we can get our l so let's go back to that and see if we can get our l so now how can we get our l we know that the total surface area was given as total surface area was equals to pi r into l plus r right to find our l now we know that our r now is given as r is given as 8 centimeters we've gotten r so we know that so using this equation now we're going to substitute it and uh, substituting we know that our total surface area has been given the question as 224 pi so we're going to say 224 pi is equals to pi and what is our r our r has been given as 8 so wherever we see r we put s so times 8 into l plus what is our r our r has been given as 8 so we know that this will go with this we are left with 224 right is equals to Eight into l plus eight so we know that this eight will open this bracket multiply by this so we're going to have two two four is equals to eight l because eight times eight is l plus sixty four plus eight times eight is sixty four so collect light times so if we collect light times now this sixty four will move to the other side why because they are all numbers and once it goes it becomes subtraction so we're going to have 224 minus 64 is equal to 8 else. So 224 minus 64. It's because 160. So we're going to say 160 is equal to 8 else. So divide both sides by what? L by 8. So we're going to have 8 here. 8 here. so 8 will go with 8 and 160 divided by 8 is 20 so therefore our L now we've gotten that our L so our L now is equals to 20 centimeters so this is our slant height so how can we get our H so remember that we said that this is a right angle triangle right so we're going to have something like this so we're going to have something like this where this was our height we've seen that and this is a slant height which we've gotten it as 20 and our radius was what our radius was given we've gotten our radius 8 centimeters right so now we're going to set since you can see the radius here see the slant height here and see the height here so we we'll give us height slant height and radius so so in this case we're going to have our h here so how can we find our h we can actually find our h using Pythagoras rule right where the Pythagoras rule says the hypotenuse square is equal to opposite square plus adjacent square so what is our hypotenuse our hypotenuse is actually two right so what is our hypotenuse our hypotenuse is actually 20 because We've gotten our L as 20. So we're going to say 20 square is equals to what is our opposite? Our opposite is actually H. So that's our unknown square plus what is our adjacent is actually H square. So we're going to have collect light times now. We're going to have H square is equals to 20 square minus H square, right? So this is going to be H square is equals to 20 square is 20 square. Is 400 so we're gonna have 400 minus x square is 64 so 400 minus 64 
is 336, right? So we have that h square is equals to the square is going to be 336. So now we're going to take the square of both sides because we're looking for h, not h square. Take the square of both sides. If you take the square of both sides, you know that these two will cancel this. We have h is equal to what is the square of 336. So we're going to say the square root of 336 is actually 18.33. So we have 18.33 centimeters. So we've gotten our h now. So it will be very, very easy for us to get the volume of this cone. The volume, remember the volume is given by 1 over 3 pi r square h. So now we have 1 over 3 times what is our pi with 22 over 7. And what is our r? That's the radius we've calculated to be what? 8 square. Then times what is our h? Our h we've calculated it to be 18.33, right? So we're going to say 18.33, right? So balance this with 1 and this with 1. Is that not? So now this is same thing as 1 times 22 times what is 8 square? 8 square is 64 times 18.33 all over 3 times 7 is 21 times 1 times 1. So this is same thing as so let's multiply it 1 times 22 times 64 times 18.33 we're going to have this long number divided by 21 we're going to have 1228.98 remember the question says we should leave our answer in the nearest whole number so the nearest whole number is going to be 1200 and 29 so we're going to say 1229 1229 centimeter what centimeter cube because it's volume so this is the volume of this cone so let's move to the next question all right question five the question says a dial was rolled a number of times the outcome are shown in the table below so we have the number of dice of course you know that number of dice ranges from one to six right we have one that have a, just a point the other one we have two points we have up to six then these are the number of outcomes that is when you roll the dice number one the one bearing one right appeared 32 times two appeared m times three appeared 25 times and so on and so forth so now if the probability of obtaining two is 0 0.15 so say the probability of obtaining two is equal to 0 0.15, right? Find the value of M, B, the number of times the die was rolled, and C, the probability of obtaining an even number, right? So now, from probability, we know that the formula is probability is of N is given as the number of outcome or we can say outcome outcome of m right outcome of n all over the total outcome so now by the time you add all the number of outcomes we, we call it the total outcome so now from our question now let's find the total outcome first so the total outcome, we can say the total outcome. We're going to add all the outcomes. We have 32 plus M plus 25 plus 40 plus 28 plus 45. Right? So now, if you collect light times and all the numbers together, we're going to have. 32 plus 25 plus 40 plus 28 plus 
45 plus 9 m so let's add all the numbers together so we have 32 plus 25 so it is 170 so 170 then plus our m so this is the total outcome so now as we said that the formula is the probability of obtaining m or n is the outcome of n over total outcome from the formula now we can say that now the probability of obtaining two is equal to the outcome of two which is what the outcome of two is actually m can you see two is the outcome is m so we're going to write m there all over what's the total outcome the total outcome is calculated to be 170 plus m so 170 plus m so now remember that the probability of obtaining two has been given this one here has been given as 0 0.15 so we're going to say substitute is going to be 0 0.15 is equal to m plus 170 plus m so balance this with one and cross multiply by the time we cross multiply of course we know that we're going to have 0 0.15 into 170 plus m is equals to m times 1 because this will multiply by this and this will multiply by this since this is called multiplication so next thing what are we going to have so we're going to open the bracket this will multiply by this and this will multiply by, by this so doing that we have 0 0.15 times 170 is 25.5 25.5 then we have 0 0.5 times is now m we're going to have 0 0.15 m plus 0 0.15 one 5m is equals to m times 1 is same thing as m so collect light times of course if we collect light times we're going to have 25.5 is equals to m now this will move to the other side why because it's actually m all the m's will move together so it's going to be minus remember once it crosses the equality sign it changes to minus 0.15m so this is same thing as 25.5 is equals to so m minus 0 0.15 and the same thing as saying 1 1 m minus 0 0.15 m so let's subtract it 1 just say 1 minus 0 0.15 is 0 0.85 say 0 0.85 m so how can we get our m we divide both sides by 0 0.85 so divide both sides by 0 0.85 we have 0 0.85 0 0.85 so this cancel this and 25 divided by 0 0.85 is equal to 30 so our m is equal to 30 m is equals to 30 so this is the outcome for 2 right this is the outcome for 2 so from the question you can see that this m now is out this m is actually what 30 so after rolling the dice the die that have 2 appeared 30 times so the b part of the question says we should find the number of times the die was rolled find the number of times the die was rolled the number of times is actually adding all the outcomes so from where we just what we just did now we are going to replace m with 30 now so we're going to have we can say b now say so number of times the die was rolled so number of times the die was rolled we just add all the outcomes so now it's going to be 32 plus 25 plus 40 plus 28 plus 45 plus 
and now our m instead of this m now we're going to write 30 we've calculated the m to be what 30 so we have plus 30 and we know that initially we calculated this to be 170 m so it's going to be 170 our m now is 30 so 170 plus 30 is actually 200 so it is equals to 200 so this is the number of times die was rolled right so the next question is we should find the probability of obtaining an even number the probability of obtaining we say even even number so how are we going to get the probability of obtaining even number we'll go back to our dies we'll go back to our table we'll now pick the number the dies that are even and what are those dies that are even of course, we know that 2 is even, we know that 4 is even, and 6 is even. So these are the dice. And how many are they? They are actually 3. They are actually 3, which is 2, 4, and 6. Right? So these are the 3 dice that are even. Now, it will be nice if we know their outcomes because that's what we're going to use. Remember that probability is equal to outcome all over total number of outcomes. So, we have 20 probability we have the number of two the outcome is 30 the number of four the outcome is 40 the number of six the outcome is 45 so i'm going to say the probability of obtaining even numbers will be equal to the outcome of now of two four and plus all over total outcome So now what is the outcome of 2? We've, we've seen that the number the outcome of 2 is 30 plus the outcome of 4 is 40 from the table and the outcome of 6 is 45. We say over the total outcome we've gotten to be what now to be 200 from our what we've calculated. So 200. So now we'll build, let's add it all through. We have 30 plus 40 plus 45. We have 115. 115 over 200. So now, what can go? Of course, 5 can go. 5 here is, is 23. And 5 here is 40. So, the probability of even number, even number is equal to 23 over 40. This is the probability of getting an even number. Now, note that whenever you calculate probability, you should be able to get a number that ranges from 0 to 1. And remember that whenever you get the probability of one, that means that thing will surely happen. So most of the times it's in fractions. So let's move to the next question. All right, question six. The question says, copy and complete the table of values for the relationship y is equal to three sine two x, right? So in this case, we have been given, some have been done for us, that is these, this and this so now what i'm going to do here i want to actually use this equation to solve for these ones so wherever that means whenever you see x at first you're going to put 15 degrees here will be 30 degrees 30 degrees and so on and so forth so with that you know that the equation has been given as y is equals to 3 sine 2x so now let's go now we we'll start with 15 degrees so for for x equals to 16 x equals to 15 degrees so we're going to have y is equals to 3 sine 2 into 15 so which is going to be y is equals to 3 sine 30 because 2 times 15 is 30 so sine 30 is 0 0.5 so we're going to have 3 times 0 0.5 
is actually 1.5 we multiply we're going to have 1.5 so this place is 1.5 then when it is 30 for x is equals to 30 so we're going to have y is equals to 3 sine 2 30 which is 3 sine 60 so sine 60 is 0 0.866 we have 0 0.866 times 3 is 2.6 right we round it up so we round half 2.6 so this is 2.6 the next one is when x is equal to 45 so let's use this place so for x equals to 45 degrees right so now this one is going to be y equals to 3 sine 2 into 45 which will be 3 sine 45 times 2 is 90 so sine 90 is 1 so we're going to have 3 times 1 which is equals to 3 here is 3 so the next one is for x is equals to 60 so we say for x is equals to 60 so we're going to have y is equals to 3 sine 2 into 60 so which will be 3 times 3 sine 2 times 60 is 120 degrees so we're going to have 3 times what is 120 sine 120 0 0.866 so trip time is 0 0.866 is 2.598 so we can approximate it to 2.6 is equals to 2.6 so we have 2.6 here right the next one is when x is 90 because that of 75 has already been done so we say for x is equals to 90 so we're going to say y is equals to 3 sine 2 into 90 right so which will be y should be 3 sine 180 degrees so which will be 3 times sine 180 zero so we have zero and three times zero is zero so th this is it here is going to be zero so the next one is 105 x is equal to 105 degrees so in this case we're going to have we're going to have y is equal to three sine two x right two into 105 so same thing as 3 sine 2 times 105 is 210 so this one is going to be 3 times sine 210 is minus 0 0.5 so I have minus 0 0.5 so times 3 is minus 1.5 So we're going to say minus 1.5. The next one is 120. Say for 120. So we know that y is equal to 3 sine 2 into 120 degrees. So we're going to say 3 sine 120 times 2 is 240. 240 degrees so sine 240 is minus 0 0.866 so we have to say 3 times minus 0 0.866 so multiply by times 3 it's minus 2.6 so minus 2.6 so Then lastly, we have for 
x is equal to 135. y is equal to 3 sine 2 into 135 degrees. So this one is going to be 3 sine. What is 2 times 135? 270. 270. So this will be 3 times. What is sine? Sine 270. Is minus one. Wow. So we have minus one here. And three times minus one, of course, is equal to minus three. So this is minus three. So now this is the table. Of course, we know that we're going to use this table to answer the B part, right? All right. Question six B. The question says using a scale of 2 cm to 15 degrees on the x axis and 2 cm to 1 unit on the y axis, draw the graph of y equals to 2 sin 2x for the value of x tending from 0 degrees to 150 degrees. So now going back to our solution, as we've solved, we're going to be draw the graph. Alright, from our solution, this was the table. So we're going to use this table and plot the graph. As you can see, this, these are the values for x and these are the values for y. So we're going to plot the graph of this. And remember we have scale. From our question, it says that using the scale of 2 centimeters to represent 15 degrees on x-axis, right? So on the x-axis, we're going to use 2 centimeters to represent 15 degrees. So this graph is already in 2 centimeters each, right? So if that's the case, each of the box, this big, big box, is going to be 15 degrees. So that means, as you know, this is the origin, it will be 0. On the x-axis, the first one is 15 degrees. The second one will be 15 plus 15 is 30 degrees. Next one will be this one will be 15 plus 30 will be 45 degrees. Then next one will be 45 plus 15 is going to be 60 degrees. Next one will be 75 degrees. Next is going to be 90 degrees. Next is going to be 105 degrees. Next one will be 120 because 105 degrees plus 15 is going to be 120 degrees. This one will be 135 degrees. Next will be 150 degrees. Degrees, right? So on the y axis now, the question says. We should use two centimeters to represent one unit on the y axis. Remember that, as we said, that all the graph is already in two centimeters each. So, two centimeters represent one unit on y axis. So, that means this place is going to be one, two, three, right? Then this one will be minus one, minus two, and minus three. Remember that the, this side of x is going to be a negative, negative value. So this one will be minus 15 degrees. Next one will be minus 30 degrees. But if we check our values from the table, we don't have minus uh, 15 and minus 30 degrees. We don't have any negative uh, angle or negative degrees. So we don't need to put it. So next is for us to plot it. So in plotting this thing, in plotting this graph, it's very, very important for us to know the value of these small boxes in between the big boxes. Knowing the small boxes will go a long way. It will help us a lot. So in order to know the value of each small box on the y-axis, we're going to use the first value, which is 1 here, divided by the number of small boxes in between the big boxes. And we always have 10 small boxes in between these uh, big boxes. So we're going to say 1 divided by 
10 which is 0 0.1 so each of these small box on the y-axis is 0 0.1 because 1 divided by you know, 10 boxes will give you will have 0 0.1 and on the y-axis we're going to say this 15 degrees divided by the number of 10 boxes so we're going to say 15 divided by 10 is actually 1.5 so each of these small box on the x-axis is 1.5 degrees so if that's the case let's go ahead now the first thing when x is 0 y is also 0 so that's the origin we don't need to plot anything but the next one is when x is 15 degrees y is 1.5 and on the x-axis this is at 15 degrees and y is 1.5 remember we said that this small box is the value of these small boxes on the y axis is this 0 0.1 each so if the 0 0.1 and we need 1.5 this is 1 so that means if we count 5 boxes will give us 0 0.5 because 0 0.5 plus 1 will give us 1.5 so so this will be the 1.5 right so when x is 15 y is 1.5 so therefore they are going to meet here right then the next one is when x is 30 y is 2.6 so now 30 is here and on y axis we're going to look for 2.6 here is 2.6 2 is here then we're going to count six small boxes because each of the small box is 0 0.1 so 0 0.1 times 6 is going to be 0 0.6 and 0 0.6 plus 2 this 2 here is going to be 2.6 so it's going to be here so now remember when x is 30 y is 2.6 so they are going to meet here so the next one is when x is 45 y is 3 when x is 45 y is 3 so we have 45 here and y is 3 this is 3 they're going to meet here next is when x is 60 y is 2.6 again so we say 60 degrees on x is here and y is 2.6 again and remember this is 2.6 so they're going to meet here next is when x is 75 y is 1.5 when x is 75 y is 1.5 so where is 75 this is 75 and 1.5 is going to be actually five boxes above one so it's going to be here they're going to meet here right the next one is when x is 90 y is zero when x is 90 y is zero so this is 90 and this is zero right this is zero and this is 90 so they're going to meet here next is when x is 105 105 y is minus 1.5 so this is a 105 and minus 1.5 that means there will be five boxes under minus one so we're going to say 105 here and minus 1.5 is going to be it's going to be here see and where are they going to meet they're going to meet here next is when x is 120 degrees y is minus 2.6 so 120 degrees is here then minus 2.6 is going to be six boxes under minus two so six boxes under minus two this is 2.6 these are six boxes 2.6 is here and they are going to meet here because it's when x is 120 degrees y is minus 2.6 so they're going to meet here the next one is when x is 135 degrees y is minus 3 so this one uh, 135 degrees y it is minus y is minus 3 and this minus 3 and they're going to meet here meet here then the last one is when x is 150 degrees y is minus 
So 150 degrees is here. Minus 2.66 boxes are under 2 minus 2. It's going to be here. So the next thing is to plot our graph joining all the necessary points. Right? So now using ruler to connect all the points we've marked. It will be better to use ruler because it will give you a straight line and it will be neat. Right, this is our graph is looking neat and okay. So the next thing is to answer the sub question under the graph. That's question six. It says use the graph to find the use the graph to find the truth set of i three sine two x plus two equals to zero. So in this case, we're going to resolve this in such a way that we are going to move these two to the other side. Right? If you move to the other side, it's going to be minus two. Is that not? So we're going to have y is equal to minus two. That's the meaning. Y is equal to minus two. So we're going to locate minus two on the graph. And uh, if we get minus two, then we'll trace to the value of x. So when y is minus two, x is going to be what? So let's see. When it is minus two, use a dot line at least to, so that it will distinguish it from other line. To where it will meet the graph. So here's it. So we have this. Can you see? Then we're going to trace it directly on x axis. Use the ruler again. Can you see where they're meeting? Here. So we trace it directly on the x axis. And have something like this. So we'll find the point here. I see. So now the question is, what is the point here? That's what the question is talking about. What is the point here? What is the point here? So it's very easy to to get it. Why? Because this is 105. Remember, we said that all the small boxes on x-axis is 1.5 degrees. So if this 1.5 degrees, how many boxes do we have after 105? So we're going to count the number of boxes. Here after 105 is one, two, three, four, four and a half. That's 4.5 number of boxes. And remember that each the value of each box on the x-axis is 1.5. So we're going to say 1.5 times 4.5. So it's actually equals to 6.75. And remember that it is after 105. So we'll add this 105. So we know the total points. This goes to 111.75. So the value of this point here is 111.75. So that's what we're going to say. So our x will be 111.75. Right? So when y is minus 2, this is the value of x, 111.75. And that is the true value of this. So the next one, that's CII, is 2 over 3 sine 2x equals to 0 0.25. So in this case, we're going to we're not going to move anything to the other side. We're just going to find the value of 0 0.25 on the y-axis. Then we'll trace it to the x-axis. So 0 0.25. So 0 0.25 on the y-axis, we know that each of the small box on the y-axis is 0 0.1 so 0 0.25 will have to count two boxes that's 0 0.2 and a half of that right so it will be 0 0.25 so it's going to be here at the center between these boxes so trace it in this case this one is going to touch two of the graph you have one here 
then keep on tracing it to the other part of the drive. And this is the second part of the drive. So trace it back down to the x axis. So it's going to meet it here. Trace it down. And the other one is here. So I'm going to trace it here. Let's do for the point. It's meeting here. The graph. And trace it down. Good. So now, what are the points on the x axis? Remember, we said that when y is equal to 0 0.25, x will be what? So let's see. Remember, we said that each of the small box on the x axis is 1.5. So this one is, we have 1 and we have 2. So it's going to give us 3 degrees. So it's going to give us 3 degrees. The first one. Then the second one is on this box. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, the ninth box. So 9 times 1.5 is going to be 13.5. Then plus 75, right? 75, this 75 degrees. So 75 degrees. So, so the answer is 8.5. 8 at 8.5, all right. 0.5. So when y is 0 0.25, x is 3 degrees and at 8.5 degrees. So these are the true value of the equation. So, so with this, I think that's the end of the question. Let's move to the next question. Question 7 is says that the diagram shows a wooden structure in the form of a cone mounted on a hemispherical base. The vertical height of the cone is 48 meters and the base radius is 14. Calculate correct to three significant figures the surface area of the structure, taking the pi is 22 over 7. So now we know that it is actually a cone, right? This is exactly what the question is talking about, right? So, there's a cone mounted on a hemispherical base. What's the meaning of hemispherical base? A hemispherical base is just like a truncated cycle or a truncated sphere, per se, a sphere that has been cut from the center. So, now we know that in a cone, this is called a slant height. And it's usually signified L, and this is called the height, which is always H, and this is called the radius of the base, right? Since it has a circular base. So now the question says that in the diagram shown a wooden structure in the form of a form of a cone mounted on a hemispherical base, the vertical height of the cone is 48 meters. So this H is actually 48 meters. 48 meters right and the base radius is 14 meters so is 14 meters correct to three significant go the surface area of the structure this is actually very simple to some extent why if we know the area of all the parts we will be able to find the surface area so now we know that the slant height is given by the formula. The area for the slant height is by RL. This is by RL. Then the circular base. You know there is a circular base. The circular base here is actually pi R square, right? So we have pi R square. Then we have the hemispherical base. This place here is actually a formula for it. We want to calculate the surface area is usually given by 2 pi r square 2 pi r square 
So we're going to have this one here as 2 pi r squared. So this is all that we have. So the total surface area now is just by adding all of them. So we said the total surface area is going to be pi r l plus pi r square plus 2 pi r square. So this is the formula we're going to use. So in this case now, what do they have in common? You can factor it out. They have pi r, pi r, and pi r. So if you factor pi r out, we're going to have pi r into l plus r plus 2r. Why? Because pi r times l is going to give us pi r l. Right? Then pi r times r is going to be pi r square and pi r times 2r is going to give us pi r is going to give us 2 pi r square so so now this is a formula for the total surface area but the question is we already have our pi we have our radius which is r and we have our h right we have our h so the question is what is then our l of course we don't have l so how are we going to find l so this is actually going to be simple because if we check this diagram we have a right angle triangle here this is a right angle triangle so since that is a right angle triangle so we have something like this we have this is the height which is 48 meters and we have our radius which will be the adjacent as 14 meters and we have our l here which we don't know right so with this one now you can see that it's very possible for us to calculate our l using the Pythagoras rule and the Pythagoras rule as we have seen earlier that is hypotenuse square is equal to opposite square plus adjacent square so what is hypotenuse our hypotenuse is l square which is our unknown is equal to the opposite which is 48 plus our adjacent which is 14 square so this is going to be l square is 48 square is 2304 we have plus 14 square Is 196 so if you add this plus 2000 and 2304 plus is 2500 so we have our l square is goes to 2500 so what we're going to do we take the square of both sides if we take the square of both sides going to have l square is equals to the square root of 2500 so this square will cancel this what is the square of 2500 is actually 50 so our l is 50 meters so now the total surface area proper total surface area is given by now um, pi r l of pi r l plus pi r square plus 2 pi r square so let's substitute is going to have what is our pi our pi is 22 over 7 and we have time is what is our r our r is 14 from this can see then we have time is what is our L we've calculated it to be 50 meters so we have 50 then we have plus our pi again which is 22 over 7 then we have time is what is our R square our R square is going to be 14 square then we have plus 
2 times 22 over 7, that's this, times our r square is, which is this, 14 square. So this is what we have. So now let's do a little cancellation. We have 7 here is 1, 7 here is 2, right? Then we're going to have 22 times 2 times 50 plus 22 over 7 times. So we have 14 square. Let's use a calculator. 296. Then plus 2 times 22 over 7 times 14 square is the same thing as 196. Right? So now, what can go? Of course, 7 can go into 196. It's 28. So now we can say that 7 here is 1. 7 here is 28. This one to 7 here is 1. 7 here is 28. So we are now left with 22 times 2 times 50 plus 22 times 28 plus 2 times 22 times 28. So let's do the calculation. 22 times 2 is 44 times 50 plus 22 times 28 is 616 have 616 plus 2 times 22 is 44 plus 28 so let's multiply and add we have 44 times 50 plus 50 is 2200 2200 plus 616 plus 44 plus 28 so let's add them plus 616 plus 44 plus 28 is 2 8 8 8 so the total surface area is 2 8 8 and 2888 meter remember meter square because it's area so this is the total surface area of this structure so you so you can see it is very important for us for you to know the formula for finding the area of the individual structure that is the cone and the hemisphere right so let's move question seven b now the question says five years ago musa was twice as old as cc sorry if i pronounce it wrong if the sum of their ages is 100 Find she says present age, right? So now we know that Musa was as twice as old as Sisi, right? So, but do we know Musa's age? No. So let's say let Musa's age be x, right? So let it be x. So now, if it is x. This and C says H. We say let C says H. Be Y. So now from the question, we're going to take it statement by statement. Say so five years ago. So if we subtract five years ago, if we subtract five years from each of them. So we're going to subtract what five years from each of them, right? So five years ago, Musa was twice as old as Sisi. So now we know that five years ago Musa will be what 
5 years ago, Musa was x minus 5, right? We said that 5 years ago, Musa was twice sister's age. So Musa is equal to twice into sister's age, which is what y. Remember, it's 5 years ago, subtract 5 also from this, right? So this is our actual our equation 1. Then, if the sum of their ages, right? So if you add Musa plus CC is equal to 100. So this will be our equation 2. You can see? So in this case now, let's solve it. We're going to have the equation 1 now. If you open the bracket, we're going to have x minus 5 is equal to 2y minus 10. Right? So now I'm collecting the items. We're going to have x minus 2y is equals to minus 10 plus 5 right decide to collect light times so this one is going to be x minus 2y is equals to minus 10 plus 5 is minus 5 right so this will be our equation 3 so bringing equation 3 and so bringing equation 3 and equation 2 together so what is our equation 3 our equation 3 is here we have x minus 2y is equal to minus 5 then what is our equation 2 our equation 2 is x plus y is equal to 100 so now this is simultaneous equation how can we solve this? Of course, basically we know that there are methods of solving simultaneous equation, and the most popular method is elimination and substitution method. Right? We can also use graphical method, but in this case, I'm going to use the elimination method. So, as we know that in the elimination method will try to move one of the unknown as we're trying to eliminate it, and how we're going to eliminate this? By the time we subtract. So x minus x, of course, will be zero right so now we are left with minus 2y that's minus 2 then minus plus y that's 1 because the equation of y here is 1 so plus 1 so this is going to be minus 2 negative positive is negative we have 1 so minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3 so this one is going to be minus 3y is equals to minus 5 this one here minus 100 that's this right minus 5 minus 100 of course it's going to be minus 5 minus 100 is equal to a minus 105 can you see minus 105 so 1 minus 105 here So divide both sides by minus 3. This will cancel this, right? Then this minus sign will cancel this minus sign. 105 divided by 3. It's 35. So our y is 35. So remember that y is actually C says h. So now we says therefore C say is what 35 35 is so the question says we should find c says h and which is 35 but i hope you know that you can also find musa's s from a from here so let's give it a try even though the question did not ask us to do that so now if we also find musa's h we're going to substitute this y in any equation so we can substitute the equation one so we can say substitute y is equal to 35 in equation 1 in equation in equation 2 so put in equation 2 so now we know that equation 2 is, is x plus y is equal to 100 and what is our y our y has been given as 35 we've calculated it so we have x is equal we have x plus 35 is equal to 100 
So x now is equals to taking collecting like items 100 minus 35. is 65 so x is going to be 65 so this is, this is Musa's age so this is how to go about this question so let's move to the next question all right question 8a the question says mrs maureen spent one over four of her monthly income at a shopping mall one over three at the open market and two over five of the remaining amount at a mechanic shop. If she had 225,000 naira left, find I, her monthly income and two, the amount spent at the open market. So from the question now, we know that she spent one over four at the shopping mall. So it says shopping mall, one over four. Then she spent one over three at the open market. Spend one over three. And she spent one two over five of the remaining amount at the mechanic shop. So it's a mechanic shop. Two over five of the remaining. Now after all this spending she was left with 225,000 naira so we're going to say left over 225,000 naira now the question is first question we are to find her monthly salary so in this case after receiving the salary she spent all this and she was left with this so the question is how much was her salary of course we don't know the amount the amount um her salary so we're going to make the salary to be x so it's a salary is equals to x because we don't know the amount so in this case now um, for the proper amount of sh sh she spent in the shopping mall associating it to the salary we're going to say now we're going to say for shopping mall now for shopping mall now Remember, she spent one over four of her salary. So, of the salary. So, in this case now, this is going to give us what? One over four of x. And of in mathematics means times. So, one over four of x because x is a salary. So, in this case now, balance this with one. It's going to be, it's going to be one times x. This one times x is x. So we have x here over 4 times 1 is 4. So associating the amount she spent in the shopping mall to her salary is going to be x over 4. Then the next one, we're going to find out the amount she spent in the open market relating it to the salary. So for open market now, so for open market, we're going to do the same. She spent what? 1 over 3 of her salary. So this is going to be 1 over 3 times the salary x. Balance this with 1 is going to be 1 times x is x over 3. So this is the amount she spent in the open market. Then the next thing is the one in the mechanic shop. In the, the one in the mechanic shop is the problem. Why? Because we don't know the remaining. She spent 2 over 5 of the, re, the remaining. So we don't know the remaining so we have to find the remaining in order for us to know the amount she spent in the mechanic associated as uh, associated to the salary so now to get the remaining now we say so to get the remaining how are we going to do of course in order for us to get the remaining it's very easy if you are given a salary and you spend it the leftover is actually the remaining so it says salary minus our expenses we're going to get our remaining uh the remaining so in this case we're going to say this one will be the salary minus expenses what is the salary the salary is actually x right so this is the salary 
x. So we're going to say x. The expenses is we're going to say x minus the expenses. Um, what was the expenses? The expenses is she spent this and this. This were the expenses. So we're going to add the expenses together, subtract it from the salary. We're going to say x over four plus x over three. So these were the expenses. So now salary minus expenses. You can as well balance this one with one. Balance this with one now. You can take the LCM because all the denominators are different. But you can also solve the bracket first before you can as well take the LCM. The LCM of 4, 1, and 3 is 12. So we're going to say 12. And 12 divided by 1 is 12. And 12 times is this x is 12x. So we have 12x minus. 12 divided by this 4 is 3. And 3 times x is 3x. So we're going to say open bracket 3x plus 12 divided by 3 is 4. And 4 times the numerator x is 4x. So we're going to have 4x. Right? Close the bracket. So in this case, now we have 12x minus. 3x plus 4x is 7x. So we're going to say 7x over 12. Right? So 12 minus 7 is 5. So we're going to have 5x over 12. So this is our remaining. So in this case now, we can go back to the mechanic now. So now we're going to, so for the mechanic now, we're going to say mechanic for the mechanic now we're going to say she spent what remember from the question the question says she spent two over five two over five of the remaining so in this case now we've gotten our remaining as 5x over 12 so we're going to say two over five of remaining the same thing as two over five of and um, the meaning of is times the meaning of is times over 5 times the remaining which is what 5x over 12 because th this is the remaining so in this case what can cancel 5 here can cancel this 5 we're left with x and 2 here is 1 2 here is 6 right so we're left with 1 times is this x is x so we have x over remember it's 1 here 1 times is this 6 is 6 so this is the amount she spent in the mechanic shop. Now, now getting this, it is very easy for us to know the total amount she got as her salary. So now, in this case, so to know the amount now, that the, to know the salary, what are we going to do? We're going to add all the expenses and the leftover. Because if you add the expenses plus the leftover, we we'll know her total salary. So now we're going to say total salary is equal to expenses plus leftover. What was the expenses? What were our expenses? Of course, we know our expenses were. The first one, she went to the shopping mall, which was x over 4 plus. She then, then she went to the open market, which is x over 3. Then the mechanic shop, which we've already calculated to be x over 6. Then plus the leftover, which is what? This. 225,000. We have 225,000. If you add all this one, will give us the salary. And what is the salary? The salary is X. Can you see? All this one. If you add the expenses plus the uh, leftover, we're going to get the salary, which is what? X. So now um, balance this one with what? 1. And balance this one with 1, 2. So what is the LCM? The LCM of 6. 4, 3, and 1 is 12. So, draw a line. So, the LCM we say is 
12. Now, no? 12 divided by this 4 is 3. So 3 times 3 times x plus 12 divided by 3 is 4 and 4 times x is 4x. Then plus 12 divided by this 6 is 2 and 2 times the x at the top is 2x. Plus 1 times 1 divided by 12 divided by 1 is 12 and 12 times 225,000. So let's use a calculator. If you multiply 12 times 225,000, you're going to have 2,700,000. And 12 divided by the last one here is 12. And 12 times the x is going to be 12x. So whenever you are taking the LCM of fraction and there's equality sign like this one here, you cancel the LCM after the manipulation. So we cancel this LCM. But if this equal sign was not here, we would have just used this LCM as the denominator. So we'll cancel that. So if we cancel that, we're now going to have a straight line equation, which will be 3x plus 4x plus 2x. So 3x plus 4x is 7x, and 7x plus 2x is actually 9x. So we're going to have 9x plus 2,700,000 is equals to 12x. So collecting like terms now, huh? of course, we know that this 9x will move to the other side, right? And if it moves to the other side, it's going to be minus. So we're going to have 2,700,000 is equals to 12x minus 9x. So this one is going to be 2,700,000 thousand is equal to 12 minus 9 is actually 3x so 3x so divide both sides by what divide both sides by the one with the alphabet which is 3 so divide by the coefficient of the alphabet which is 3 so divide both sides by 3 3 so this cancels this so we're going to say so now we're going to say 2 uh, two million seven hundred thousand divided by 3 so we're going to say divide this by 3. It's actually 900,000. So x is equal to 900,000 naira. So this is the salary. Uh, salary, this is our salary, right? So let's move to the next question. The second part of the question says we should find out the amount spent at the open market. So now remember that she spent one over three of the salary in the open market. Getting the second part of the question is very, very easy. Why? Because we already know the salary now. And remember she spent one over three of her salary in the open market. So let's get that one. So the second part. So amount spent in the open market. So remember we said that she spent what? One over three of one over three of salary. So this is going to be one over three of what is the salary? The salary now is nine hundred thousand. So of nine hundred thousand. And what's the meaning of of means time? So it's one over three times nine hundred thousand over one. So three here is one. So nine hundred thousand divided by three is going to be three hundred thousand. Nine hundred thousand divided by three. Wow. So she actually spent three hundred thousand at the shopping mall. So. It's going to be this one here is 300,000. So it's actually 300,000 naira. So this is the amount she spent in the open market, right? In the open market. So with this, I think that's the end of this question. Let's move to the next question.
All right, question 8b. The question says that third term of an arithmetic progression, AP, is 4m minus 2n. If the ninth term of the progression is 2m minus 8n, find the common difference in terms of m and n. Right? So from the question now, we know that the thought, you know that the formula for calculating AP is given by Tn is equal to a plus into n minus 1 d where n is not at the n term that's the number of terms then a is not at the first term and lastly d is known as the common difference Right? So, from the question now, the question says the third term of the arithmetic progression. The third term of an arithmetic progression is 4m minus 2n. So, now it's going to be the third term. So, that's t3. t3 is equal to the first term has not been given plus into, now the n is 3 because it's third term. So, it's a 3 minus 1 into d. That's the difference. It's now equal to what? He said is 4m minus 2n. So this is our equation 1. And the second part of the equation says if the ninth term, that's t9, is equal to now a plus into what is our n in this case? Our n in this case is 9. Minus 1 into A. D is equal to, if the ninth term of the progression is 2M minus 8N. So, we're going to say 2M minus 8N. So, in this case, this will be the equation 2. Now, solving the equation individually, let's start with equation 3. So, equation 3 now. Equation 1 now. We're going to have a plus into 3 minus 1 is 2 into d is equal to 4m equals to 4m minus 2n. So open this bracket, it's open this bracket is going to be a plus 2 times d is 2d is equal to 4m minus 2n. So this will be the equation 3. So now solving equation two, just like equation one. Solving equation two, just like equation one. You know we have a plus into nine minus one here is going to be eight. So write eight here. D is equal to two m minus eight n. This one, if you open the bracket, it's going to be a plus d because a times d is a d is equals to 2m minus at n so this is equation 4 this one will be equation 4 so now what i'm going to do next of course we're going to bring equation 3 and equation 4 together so equation 3 and 4 together we're going to have carry out equation 3 is going to be a plus 2d is equals to 4m minus 2n, right? Then our equation, then our equation 4 is a plus 8d is equals to 2m minus 8n. So what I'm going to do, of course, this is a simultaneous equation. There are so many methods of uh, solving simultaneous equation, but in this case, I'm going to use elimination method in the elimination method we are aware that we're going to eliminate one of the unknown right um in eliminating the unknown whenever the unknowns you want to eliminate have the same sign you subtract but when the unknown you want to eliminate have different sign all right in this case subtract a minus a it will go we have two minus eight is minus 60.
is equals to 4 4m minus 2m is going to be 2m then minus 2 minus minus 8 will be minus 2 minus minus 8 so it's going to be minus 2 plus 8 because minus minus is plus so minus 2 plus 8 is plus 6 so we're going to say plus 6n so now we divide both sides by minus 6 in order to get d minus 6 over minus 6 so this minus 6 cancel this minus 6 i left with d is equals to 2m plus 6n over minus 6 so we can factorize the numerator what they have in common 2 so it's going to be d is equals to 2 into m because 2 times m will give us 2m then plus 3n because 2 times 3n will give us 6n so and our denominator minus 6 so this 2 here is 1 2 here is 3 so i left with d is equals to m plus 3n over minus 3 which is the same thing as this minus 3 will influence the numerator we're going to have which is the same thing as minus into m plus 3n over 3 so that is the value of d in this is the value of d in terms of m and n so let's move to the next question all right question nine it says two cyclists x and y leave town q at the same time cyclist x travels at the rate of five kilometer per hour on a bearing of 49 degrees and cyclist y travels at the rate of nine kilometers per hour on the bearing of 319 degrees the first question we are to illustrate the information in a diagram so at first we can see we have a five kilometer per hour and nine kilometer per hour don't worry these are speed speed is measured in kilometer per hour these are not distances right so in this case let's represent it in a diagram now the first thing to do is always use a ruler and remember that the cyclists both the cyclists left town q so town q is the starting point so this is town q right q here right now from the question now it says that cyclist x travel at the rate of five kilometer per hour on a bearing of 49 degrees 49 degrees so x is 49 degrees of q so on q now we're going to write 49 degrees right so so 49 degrees we start since it says three figure bearing we're going to start from the north 49 degrees and the first quadrant this first quadrant is 90 degrees and since it is 49 degrees it's not up to 90 degrees so it's almost half of it so we say 49 degrees will be here this is 49 degrees so use a ruler to draw it so this will be our x on that x we also draw a compass so this is our on x right so remember the speed here we'll set the speed here is equals to five kilometers per hour right then the other part of the question says and cyclist y travel at the rate of nine kilometers per hour on the bearing of 319 degrees so also from q right so 319 degrees we know that from here this one here is 90 degrees another 90 another 90 will be 270 and we're talking of 319 degrees so 319 degrees will be somewhere here so from here we say 319 degrees right so use the ruler to draw it again
draw the compass on it. So this is our Y. Right? This is our Y. And remember that remember that the speed is nine kilometers per hour. That's for Y. So it's a speed here. Nine kilometer per hour. That's for Y. Now we use the ruler to join X and Y. So this is our diagram, right? But with this diagram now, we are not yet done. Why? We need to get the angles before we move to the next thing. Now we already know that this is 49 degrees. That means this place, of course, will be 49 degrees because alternate angles are always equal. So this is 49 degrees too. Right then, we know that from here up to this place is 319 degrees. Then, how are we going to get this small angle here? It's very, very, very easy. Why? Because we know that we know that the sum of angles from this the north here round to the north back is 360 degrees. So, by the time we say 360 minus 319, we're going to get this small uh, angle. So, let's calculate it minus 319. Is 41 degrees so this place is 41 degrees so if this was 41 degrees that means it's very possible for us to get this entire angle this entire angle will be 41 plus 49 is equal to 90 degrees so this is 90 degrees and after getting this if we know that this place is 49 degrees we'll be able to get this small angle how by saying this since this one is 90 degrees from here uh, this is 90 degrees so i'm going to say 90 minus 49 we'll get the remaining one minus 49 is 41 degrees so that means this angle here is 41 degrees we may not use it now but later on we'll see the importance right so if we've gotten this place as 41 degrees from here, this one too is 41 degrees. Alternate angles, right? This is 41 degrees. So now, this is a diagram. But from the diagram now, we can deduce that since this one is 90 degrees, that means it's a right angle triangle. That means it's something like this. So we're going to have something like this. Where this will be a right angle triangle. This will be Y, this one will be our Q, and this one will be X. Can you see? So since it is right angle triangle, getting all the other parts will not be hard. So so we have answered the first question. So this is our so this is our A. Right? So let's go to the next question. The next question, last question, 9B says after traveling for two hours, calculate correct to the nearest whole number, the distance between cyclist X and cyclist Y, then the bearing of cyclist X from Y. So in this case, the time has been given as two hours. So that means all of them uh, traveled for two hours. So remember that in the question, we were not given distance, but we were rather given the speed five kilometer per hour and nine kilometer per hour right so if we're going to get the distance between cyclists x and y it is very important for us to get the distance between the cyclists the two cyclists from the starting point so since we already have the speed in this case um, it's very easy for us to get a distance remember that both of them travel for two hours so now we're going to set time is two hours right then speed for x for x that was equal to what we said five kilometers per hour and speed for y Question says is nine kilometers per hour. 
So from this now, we will be able to calculate the distance of the two cyclists. So let's say distance to get the distance. So distance of cyclists. So let's see distance of x now. Distance of cyclists x. So we know that there's a, always a relationship between time and speed with distance, where distance is equal to speed time is time. So what is the speed of x? The speed of x is five kilometers per hour. Time is time, we know it's two hours. So the distance now is gonna be 10 kilometers. So the distance between uh, the starting point and x is 10 kilometers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean this one here, clean this one up, the speed here. And board 10 kilometers. Then distance for cyclist y. Distance of cyclist y. It's going to be the same thing. Distance is because the speed time is time. So what is our speed? We know the speed speed for y is nine kilometers. So nine time is the time is two hours, right? It's gonna be equals to eighteen kilometers. So let me clean this one up. So distance between them is eighteen kilometers. So now we've gotten the distance between the two cyclists from the starting point. It will be very, very easy for us now to be able to calculate the distance from distance between y and x. Remember, we said that. So, of course, this one is going to be this our uh, y, this one will be the x, and this one will be the q, right? And we've calculated that this one is a right angle, which is 90 degrees, right? And the distance between Q and X is 10 kilometers. And here is 18 kilometers. So now with this, we'll be able to calculate the distance between X and Y using the Pythagoras theory. Since it is a right angle triangle, because we know that the Pythagoras theory is particularly on a right angle triangle. Which says that the square of the hypotenuse is always the square is always equal to the square of the opposite plus the square of the adjacent. So now, so solving for the distance now, let's make the distance small q, right? So we're going to say this is going to be hypotenuse square Pythagoras rule using Pythagoras rule, right? So this Pythagoras is going to be hypotenuse square is equal to opposite square plus adjacent square. And what is the hypotenuse? The hypotenuse is the longest side, which is what our unknown Q, right? So we're going to have Q square is because what is our opposite? Our opposite is 18. 18 square. plus the adjacent which is 10 square now so this one will be q square is equal to 18 square is what three hundred and twenty four so three hundred and twenty four plus ten square is one hundred so this one is gonna be q square equals to three hundred and twenty four plus one hundred is 424 so in this case we were looking for q so we take the square root of both sides so these two this square will cancel this square root right we're left with q is equal to 424 square the square root of 424 
is 20.59 remember the equation says we should leave our answer in what we should leave our answer in the nearest whole number so since the answer is should be in the nearest whole number but this one is going to be 21 kilometers so that means this q is 21 kilometers all right we've solved the i part of the equation the next question says we should calculate the bearing of cyclist x from y so now how are we going to calculate the bearing in calculating the bearing that means we have to calculate the from here the angle from here up to this place so that's the bearing of x from y but how are we going to get this in order for us to get this we have to calculate this using a trigonometry ratio until we get this angle if we get this angle then we manipulate it in order to get what is here right so getting this angle x is very important so we have to get this angle which is in this diagram here theta so we have to get this theta once you get this theta we'll be able to get what is there right so in this case let's calculate theta so in calculating theta now we are going to use the trigonometric ratio in this case of course we know we have a cheat known as so car and tour where sign in this case means sign is equals to opposite of a hypotenuse then cos is equals to adjacent all over hypotenuse right and finally tan is equal to opposite over adjacent but in this case now we already have opposite and we have adjacent this one and this so we'll be able to get this theta right so so now we're going to say so what do we have we have 18 and 10 now it will be better to use the relationship between opposite and adjacent because this is from the question than for you to use this 21 remember that this 21 was a calculated value so if you will use this one it's not that it's bad but what if you make a mistake in calculating this 21 of course then that means this answer the next answer is going to be wrong so it's better for you to depend on the question or on the value given from the question than for you to depend on the value you've calculated because you might be under drugs when doing so such and as a result of that you may get last the other answer wrong so he says we have adjacent and uh, opposite and the relation between adjacent and opposite is tan so i'm going to say tan this is b i b number nine b i i so we said tan theta is equal to tan is that's to our opposite all over adjacent which is same thing as what's the opposite our opposite is 18 over adjacent which is 10 so this one is going to be and theta is equals to 18 divided by 10 use our calculator is 1.8 so we're going to have 1.8 so we're looking for theta not tan so divide both side by tan by tan so this time we'll go with this so we know that we have theta is equals to what is 1 over tan same thing as tan inverse of 1.8 so what is the tan inverse of 1.8 so if we calculate it theta will be so let's see tan inverse tan inverse of 1.8 so we said shift tan 1.8 is 60.9 60.9 60.9 degrees so this is the theta here if this place is 60.9 this is our 60.9 degrees can you see so we've calculated this angle so let's go back to our diagram So that means this place, the entire place here is 60.9. So if this place is 60.9, that means it's very that means it's very possible for us to get this small angle. Because if we get this small angle, it's going to be the same with what is here. Alternate angles are equal. So how are we going to do? We're going to say 
this 60 when you say this 60.9 minus this 41 we know what is left here so we're going to say 60.9 minus 4.1 or 60.9 minus 4.41 minus 41 going to have 19.9 so this small place this small angle here this small angle here is 19.9 and if this place 19.9 definitely this small angle here is going to be 19.92 why because alternate angles are equal so now if you are going to calculate the bearing of x from flows from y we're going to add all the angles from here up to this place so that means we're going to say this 90 plus 19.9 right but in case the question says to calculate the bearing of q from y would have it would have been from here up to this place right so since it is just x from y it's just from 90 plus this 19.9 so of x from y is equal to what 90 plus 19.9 degrees right so let's add it One hundred and nine point nine degrees. So one hundred and nine point nine degrees. So that is the bearing of x from y. So that means from here up to this place is one hundred and nine point nine degrees. Can you see? So that's the bearing. So let's move to the next question. The next question does C says find the average speed at which cyclist x will get to y in four hours so in this case we're going to calculate the speed of cyclist x to y in four hours so this is actually very easy why because the time has been given to us as what well, right and we already have the distance from where we have calculated we know that the distance between them is 21 kilometers right so this is 21 kilometers we know that so we are asked to find the speed so this is very easy so C part now the C. To see now, we know that the time has been given as what? As forty as four hours. So we're going to say time is equal to four hours. Right? And the distance have been calculated to be twenty one kilometers. Can you see? Twenty one kilometers. So distance is 21 kilometers so what is speed we know that speed the average speed is equal to distance the formula over time so what is our distance our distance is 21 kilometers over our time is four hours so we're gonna have speed now because 21 divided by 4 50 is 5.25 kilometers 5.25 kilometers so in the nearest per hour is speed right so and in the nearest whole number is going to be 5 kilometer per hour so that's it let's move to the next question question 10 it says the table shows the distribution of marks obtained by students in an examination. This is actually the, the data. You can see them. And uh, the first thing in the question says that we should construct a cumulative frequency table for the distribution. That is the first question. And the question, second question says we should draw a cumulative frequency curve for the distribution. And lastly, it says using the curve, find the co find correct to one decimal place. The median mark and the lowest mark for the distribution if 15 of the students, 15% of the students pass with distinction. So now, in this case, we're going to use a table. As the question says, the first thing is to construct a cumulative frequency distribution table or cumulative frequency table for the distribution. So let's give it a try. Now, we have a table here. We're going to write the class marks. We know the class marks ranges from 0 to 9. 
10 to 19, 20 to 29, and so on and so forth. So we're going to use that here. We said max, right? We have 0 to 9, we have 10 to 10 to 19, we have 20 to 29, we have 30 to 39. Nine fifty to fifty nine ninety to ninety nine. So I believe that's the class one because here the last the last one is ninety to ninety nine, right? So the frequency, the next one is the frequency. So frequency frequency which is always signified as F. And this one is always signal as x right so the frequency here we have 7 11 17 7 11 we have 17 then we have 20 29 34 20 29 34 then 30 25 21 30 25 21 30 25 21 and 6 21 and we have 6 so these are the frequency so what are we going to do next we've been given this from the question i remember that we are targeting the what the cumulative frequency distribution table right so if does it the next thing to do is to get what we call class boundary and how do you Get the class boundary. The class boundary is using the class map. We're going to subtract half. That's all. We're just going to subtract 0 0.5 from the lower class interval and add 0 0.5 to the upper class interval, right? So, or class map. So, in this case, now we're going to say so this class boundary, we're going to subtract 5 from this 0. We're going to be what? I know 0 0.5. Is that not? Then two, this one will be nine point five. Let's see. Then next one will be ten minus zero point five will be this ten here will be nine point five to nineteen point five. The same thing, subtract five here, zero point five here will be nineteen point five to twenty nine point five. If you can observe the beginning of the previous, the, the end of the previous class boundary is the beginning of the next class boundary, right? Lower class boundary. So that's the secret. So this may will be what 29.5 to 39.5. This one will be 39.5 to 49.5. This one will be. 49.5 to 59.5 continuously so this is our class boundary right so since the question says we should find the cumulative frequency distribution table then that means the next thing to do is to find the cumulative frequency of our distribution so say cumulative frequency And how do you find cumulative frequency? Cumulative frequency is always in this form, zigzag. If you add what is, you carry the first value and put it here, and add diagonally to the to what is here, you get what is here. Then the answer here, you add diagonally to what is here, you get what is here continuously, like this. So if that's the case, then that means we're going to first carry the frequency here. Right, the frequency. So we write it. The first frequency is seven here. We're going to write it there. Can you see? Right. Then we're going to add it to eleven. So seven plus eleven is is eighteen. Right. So write eighteen here. So eighteen plus this seventeen. You can see is diagonally right. So eighteen plus seventeen is thirty five. Then thirty five plus twenty is fifty five. 
Then 55 plus 29 is 84. Then 84 plus 34 is 118. Then 118 plus this 30 is 148. Then 148 plus 25. It's going to be 173. Then 173 plus 21. Is 194. The 194 plus last is 6. You're going to have 200. So this is a cumulative frequency. And this cumulative frequency always reveals the frequency, the total frequency. So that means the total frequency here is 200. So now this is a cumulative frequency distribution table. Nothing more and nothing less. So let's move to the next question. Question 10b. It says, draw the cumulative frequency curve for the distribution. And in drawing the frequency, the cumulative frequency curve for the distribution, we usually plot a, the cumulative frequency against the upper class boundary. So these are the upper class boundary. So we're going to plot the cumulative frequency, which is this, against the class upper class boundary which is this so in this case we are going to of course use a scale that will make our work easier right in order for us to use the cumulative frequency we're going to write it cumulative frequency against the upper class boundary so so resume so now the next thing is to choose a suitable scale that will make all these points to fit into the group right so we have the cumulative frequency from 7 to 200 so we have to look for a specific scale that will make sure these all points fit into the graph for the scaling one centimeter to represent 20 units on the cumulative frequency axis so we're going to have zero the next one will be 20 20 the other one will be next one 40 then 60 80 100 120 140 160 180 and 200 so this is fitting right okay so for the upper class boundary axis we are just going to write them down right we're going to use one centimeter to represent one unit so but in this case we're going to start from 9.5 right so so the first one now we can put the first one to be 9.5 that's then the second one in case we want it to start from zero right so we can put the 9.5 here so we can make this one to be 9.5 in case we want it to start from the origin so you know that we said the upper class boundary right so the first one will be 9.5 then we have 19.5 we have 29.5 then 39.5, 49.5, continuously, we can continue it, right? So now it's now time for us to plot the cumulative frequency curve. So let's go. When the class boundary is 9.5, the cumulative frequency is 7. So, so where is 9.5 on the class boundary, upper class boundary? This is 9.5, right? And it is 7 on the cumulative frequency. So, 7. Now, the next thing to do is to find out the value of the small boxes in each of these large boxes because knowing the values will help us and it will go a long way. So, how are we going to do it? We're going to use this first value. And divided by the number of boxes right so we're going to say 20 we have 20 how many boxes we have 10 boxes 20 divided by 10 is 2 so each on this axis is what the value is 2 is that not? so each small small box is 2 units so if it is 2 unit now let's go back we're going to say that when it is 9.5 it is 7 right so now we're going to look at this is we know that this is 9.5 and the cumulative frequency is 7 so 7 you know that the first small box is 2 
the second one is 4, 6, 8. That's 4, but it's 7, so it's going to be in between. In between 6 and 8. So, we have, so in between, so it's going to be here. Okay, so, they're going to meet here. Since this one is the one, this one here is 9.5, and they're going to meet here. Then the next one is when the class boundary is 19.5, the cumulative frequency is 18. So it's going 19.5, which is here. So it's 18. So let's locate 18. 18 will be nine boxes, right? Because each box is two units. So it's going to be here. And they are going to meet here. So the next one is when class boundary is 29.5, cumulative frequency is 35. So this is our 29.5. Then 35 will be, of course, 15 boxes above 20. This is 30. 35. There is no about 32 because each box is, 30, is 2. 32. Next one is 34, then 35 will, then so it's 36, so it's going to be in between. So it's going to be here. And where are you going to meet? They're going to meet here. The next one is when the class boundary is 39.5, the cumulative frequency is 55. We have 39.5 is here. Then 55. Then 55 will be above 40. 50 will be 5 boxes above 40. So this is 50. So 55, 55 will be here. So they are going to meet here. Next one is when the class boundary is 45.5, the cumulative point is 84. So this is our 49.5, right? Cumulative point is 84. So 84, we have 80 and 4 is 2 boxes above, which is here. So they are going to meet here. Right? So the next is when class boundary is 59.5, the cumulative process is 118. So this is our 50, this is our 59.5. Right? Then we are going to locate 118 on the cumulative frequency so 118 of course we know 100 is here and 18 will be nine boxes above 100 so it will be, it is here so where are they going to meet they are going to meet here so the next one is is when it is 69.5 the that's the boundary then it is 148 so so 69 is here 69.5 then we're going to locate 148 right so we already have 140 then that means it's going to be four boxes since we said each small box is two unit which is here and they're going to meet here so the next one is the class boundary is 79.5 and the 79.5 it is 173 so now we know that this is 79.5 and uh, 173 we're going to locate it so 173 so we're going to 170 is five boxes above 160 this is 170 so 173 so they're going to meet here so the next one when it is 89.5 the cumulative frequency is 194 so of course this is at 89.5 then 194 will be let's say we have 180 190 is five or six above 180 then 194 is going to be going to be here so where are they going to meet of course they are going to meet here then lastly is when it is 99.5 the cumulative frequency is 200 so we're going to check this is 99.5 so 200 is actually here right so they're going to meet here so now we're going to join the points together right so join the points we're going to have something like this
these are cumulative frequency curve for the distribution. So let's move to the next question. All right, the third part of the question, that's question 10C, says using the curve, find correct to one decimal place the median mark. We're going to find the median mark. And how we're going to find the median mark from our curve is actually very simple. How we're going to do it? What is median? Median means the median number, right? Or the median value. So if we're going to do that, so the easiest thing to do here is that we're going to say median median is equal to half. You take half of the cumulative frequency. And what is our cumulative frequency? The highest cumulative frequency is what is actually 200. So we're going to say 200 divided by 2. So 200 divided by 2, which is going to be. So this one is going to be 200 divided by 2, which is what? 100. So we're going to locate 100 on the cumulative frequency curve. Then we'll trace it down to the upper class boundary. So let's see. So let's locate it. 100 is here. So use your ruler. 100 is here. Trace it on the curve. This is the curve here. Once you meet the curve, you stop, then trace it down to the upper class boundary. So trace it down. So this is it. So we're going to find what is this point, the point here. That will be our answer. So we're going to say median. So let's find, let's try to find the points in between. So each of these small boxes on the upper class boundary is one one point. So this one is 49. The next one, can you see, is between this one, right? So the last one is 49.5. The next one will be 49. That's 50.5, 51.5, 52.5, 53.5. So it's going to be 53.5. Here is it, 53.5. So the median now is also 53.5. I hope you know, understand. You have to first know the total cumulative frequency, divide it by two, then locate it on that axis, trace it to the curve and trace it down to the upper class boundary axis. Then whatever point you get, that will be your median. So let's move to the next question. All right, the last part of the question, that's question 10 CII. The question says, we should calculate the lowest mark for the distinction if 5% of the students pass with distinction. So we're going to calculate the lowest mark for the distinction from the graph. Remember, we're going to use the graph, right? So now in this case now, it's given, we're given 5%. And what is the meaning of 5%? So 5% means, we say 5%. 5% now, this 5% is 5% of the frequency, right? That's 5% of these 200. So it will be 5% of 200. And what is the meaning of 5%? The meaning of 5% is 5 over 100. So 5 over 100, then time is the 200. So we know that 100 here is 1, 100 here is 2. So we're left with what? 5 times is 2, which is what? 10. So we're going to look at 10 on the cumulative frequency graph. Then we'll see what it will give us on the upper class boundary. Right? So now let's see 10 on the cumulative frequency axis. So use your ruler. This is 10. That's five boxes since each of the small box is two units so so this is 10 that's five boxes as we said so you trace it on the line to the graph and this is it right then trace it down here's it it's meeting on this point then you trace it down so now we are going to look for the point here what is this point here because that will be up the lowest 
value so then we know that each of this point is one one unit on the upper class boundary axis right so this is 9.5 the next one is 10.5 next one is 11.5 so we have 9.5 the next one 10.5 next is 11.5 you can see that the line is in between between 11.5 and 12.5 so which is supposed to be 12 right it is 12 so add half to it as 12 so therefore add four five percent the point will be what the point will be 12 units so that is the answer sometimes if you try yours it might not be the same why because of the protein you may not get the same thing but what you need to know is that the examiners always look for um, the point now if this is 12 they may likely put plus minus so that means if you get two points above 12 or two points below 12 then you are actually correct so you may solve it and you will not get exactly the 12 that i'm getting here right so let's move to the next question so question 11a the question says in the diagram MNPQ is a cycle with a center O, right? So that means this is the center, right? So line MN is equal to line NP. So you can say MN, here is it, is equal to line NP. So you can see this stroke, this stroke will always show you that the sides are equal. And angle OMN is equal to 50. Of course, we know that when we said OMN, that means the angle is at M, right? So O m n which is 50 so the letter at the center carries the angle right we should find i angle m n p angle m n p where is angle m m n p since we say that the alphabet always the alphabet at the center carries the angle that is m n p so we have to find this place so that is the first question this one here yeah. so how can we find this the first thing to note is that whatever you write you have to back it up with a low or low or a theory because that is the topic the topic is cyclic theory so you don't just go ahead and calculate and move you have to give a reason right so the first thing to note here is that this is a semicycle from the question from here you can see there's a line here and remember there is a law that says that whenever you have an angle that makes that is from a semicycle it will always form a right angle that's 90 degrees so that means this p is 90 degrees m now m p q will be 90 degrees right so that's the first thing to do so we're going to say angle m p Q is equal to 90 degrees. And what is the reason? Of course, the reason here is let's use a black color. The reason here is angle in a semicycle is 90. So that is a theory. And since that place is 90 degrees, another thing to note here, you know, we have to follow all the rules so that we can be able to get the this angle here. So now the next thing to note here is that there's a quadrilateral from here. How many sides? There are four sides. And four-sided plane shape are called quadrilateral. So there is a cyclic quadrilateral. Um, one of the laws says that if you have an angle here and the opposite angle to it is supplementary, that means opposite angles of a cyclic quadrilateral are supplementary. What does what does that mean? It means when you add the two sides, you should be able to get 180 degrees. So the question is, what if the other side is given and the other side is not given? The simple thing here is to carry the side that is given, subtract it from 180. You get the other one. So in this case, we have given 50 here, right? So we're going to say 180 minus 50. We we'll get angle P, right? So now we'll say n p q that's this angle is 180 minus 50 why because 
opposite angle of a cyclic quadrilateral are supplementary. So, so we're going to say angle N P Q is equals to what? Is equals to 180 minus 50 degrees, right? And what is the theory? The theory here is that opposite angles. Of cyclic quadrilateral, quadrilateral, the short, are supplementary. So close the bracket. So in this case, now if you subtract it, what will be the answer? The answer our angle NPQ 180 minus 50 is 130 degrees right so if we've gotten that distance from here remember that this one here is 90 degrees this one is 90 degrees so the from here up to this place is 130 degrees so if that place is 130 degrees that means we will be able to get this angle why how by the time we carry this 130 degrees minus this 90, this 90 here, we're going to get this small angle. So we're going to say this angle, angle NPM, right? See the angle, this angle here, angle NPM. We'll say angle NPM is equal to, right? Is equal to 130 degrees minus the 90 degrees right so it's going to be equals to what is equals to 40 degrees that's one thing to note so we've gotten that this angle here now is what 40 degrees so after getting this one it's very easy to get this small angle from here like this why remember that these ones are the same Right, they are equal since they are equal now the base now will also the angle will be equal so that means that means angle n m p which is this one here at the center is same thing as 40 degrees why because base of an isosceles triangle are equal right the angle of the base of a isosceles triangle are always equal remember that isosceles triangle have two sides equal so we're going to say Angle N M P is equals to forty degrees. And what is the reason? The reason here will be say base of an isosceles triangle. Isosceles triangle. So let's read in for in short is equal. Is also 40 degrees. So with this one now, we'll be able to get this n. Our question is very easy. How? By the time we add the 40 plus this 40, since they are in triangle, we'll be able to get this, right? Sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. So that means we'll be able to get angle. Well, we're going to get able to get this angle n. How? We're going to say now our question. Now we're going to get our angle M and B is equals to what? It's going to be 180 degrees minus 40 plus 40. Why? Sum of angle in triangle, right? It's 180 degrees. So therefore, so therefore, our angle M and P will be equals to 180 minus 40 plus 40 is 80 and angle m and p is equals to 100 degrees so we've gotten our first question so that means this place is 180 degrees it's actually 100 degrees so the second part of the question that's i i so we should find angle p O 
Q. So which one is angle P O Q? Angle P O Q. So the angle will be at the center, which is O. So that means we are going to find this. This angle. How are we going to find this angle? Of course, it's very easy. How? The first thing to note here is that since we already know that from here all the way to here is 50 degrees, right? That means we'll be able to get this small one. By the time we say this 50, the entire angle, and this 40 degrees, we'll get this small one. So we'll say that angle what? Angle O M P, because this is this one right here it's going to be 50 minus 40 angle o m p is equals to 50 minus 40 which is what 10 degrees right so if it's 10 degrees that means this place here is 10 degrees can you see now if you add this 10 plus this 40 you get 50 which is correct so yeah, after getting this Remember that this one here, this line is from the center all to this place, right? It's still tell you there's a radius because radius is any line that is from the center to any point of the circumference, and this one too is from here to this to the center, it's also radius. That means they are the same. That means this line and this line are the same. So if they are the same now, then this angle, of course, this 10, this place too will be 10 because base of an isosceles triangle is that not so. With this, we can say that this one here and this one here are the same, right? So if they are the same now, we can boldly say that angle MPO is 10 degrees, right? So we said angle MPO is also what 10 degrees. Why? Because the the reason is based of an isosceles triangle. Is what is equal. So, in this case, then this place will be ten degrees too. So if this place is 10 degrees, we'll be able to get this. Why? Remember that from remember from here to here is 90 degrees. So if you carry 90 minus this small 10, this angle. So we're going to say angle OPQ, right? Angle OPQ, that's this angle, is angle O P Q now will be ninety minus ten, which is what? Which is eighty degrees. And if this place is eighty degrees, <laughs> of course you know that this one too is from the center to the circumference, which is also a radius. And if this radius, that means this place too is. That means this line will be equal to this line. So. If this place now we've calculated already to be 80, this one here, to be 80, 80 degrees, right? Will be the same with this. Why? Because, of course, the two lines are the same. This one here is the same with this. So the angles will be the same. So in this case, we're going to say angle, angle OQP. Angle OQ P is also 80 degrees. And why? Let's write the base of an ISO slash triangle is equal. I see so now we've gotten this is now very very easy to get our angle this angle here why because it's a triangle if you add, it's a triangle if you add 80 plus 80 you get what they say right so in this case we're going to say write it here 
awa angle p o q is equal to of course 180 degrees minus into 80 plus 80 why what is the theory we say that sum of angles in triangle is 180 degrees right so this one is going to be equals to 180 minus 80 plus 80 is 160 degrees and this one here 180 minus 160 degrees is going to be 20 degrees so this is the answer of p o q so that's our answer very easy right so always follow step by step right sometimes you may have another way of solving it it's okay so far there's a proof for it right it's all about reasoning you have to reason well right so know all the theories it will help you and try to understand the question first so let's move to the next question all right question 11b the question says find the equation of the line which has the same gradient as 8y plus 4x is also 24 and passes through the point minus 8 and 12 so in this case now we have that the gradient equation same gradient as what 8y plus 4x is equals to 24 right and remember that the points are so it's a point our minus 8 and 12 so now how are we going to do it we are going to make y the subject formula in this equation first so if we make y the subject formula then we'll be able to deduce the gradient that's m remember that this is a linear equation and a linear equation is always in the form so we have to make it in the form of y is equals to m x plus c where we know that where m is a gradient the gradient and c is the constant right so this is it so now in this case what are we going to do we want to make this equation to be in this form so the best way to do it is we have 8y plus 4x is equal to 24 right so we'll make sure this 4x move to the other side and uh, if it moves to the other side it's going to be minus right so now we'll be having 8y is equal to 24 minus 4x right so we're going to rearrange it so that the constant this x will be at the center so rearranging it now if you rearrange it we're going to have 8y is equal to minus 4 x plus 24 this is this equation is something as this but just because uh i rearrange it right you can see that this minus sign minus 4 is here and this 24 is here plus 24 so in this case now we want to make y the square formula so we'll divide all through by 8 so if we divide all through by 8 this one will be 8 8 and 8 right so this x will cancel this and 4 here is 1 4 here is 2 then 8 here is 1 8 here is 3 right so we're left with y is equals to minus 1 over 2x plus 3 right so now this is our gradient our gradient now that's the m which is in this form c there is minus 1 over 2 so so in this case we're going to say our m now can you see the the m is here so our m which is a gradient is equals to minus one over two so with this one now of course we know that there is an equation if you want to find the equation for if you want to find the equation of the line is a formula for it which is usually y is minus y1 is equal to m into x minus x1 where this 
y1 and this x1 is from our points so now this will be our x1 and this one will be our y1 so now we want to substitute it remember that this m now is from this gradient so in this case we're going to say y substituting so we're going to say y minus what is y1 is 12 right it's equals what is our m our m is minus 1 over 2 into x minus what is our x1 is minus 8 right so this is it so this one is going to be y minus 12 is equals to minus 1 over 2 into x y time minus time is minus is plus 8 right so if you balance this one with one of course you know that this one will multiply by all this right so open the bracket we're going to have y minus 12 is equals to minus 1 this minus 1 times x is minus x so we have minus x minus 1 times plus 8 is going to be minus 8 all over 2 because this 2 times 1 is 2 so what are we going to do here now balance this one with 1 if you balance it with 1 you can you can cross multiply right if you cross multiply now we're going to have this 2 multiply by this right so we're going to say 2 into y minus 12 is equals to 1 multiplied by this it's going to be minus x minus 8 so open the bracket out of this bracket we're going to have 2y minus 2 times 12 is 24 is equals to minus x minus 8 so collecting light terms We collect light times now you know that this number will move to the other side where this head is right so in this case we're going to have 2y is equals to minus x minus 8 now will be plus 24 because it has crossed the equality sign this is going to be 2y is equals to minus x then minus 8 plus 24 is plus 16 so plus 16 so this is the equation of the line right this is the equation very easy right so with this we move to the next question right question 12a question says in the diagram a b is a tangent to the circle with the center pole so of course we know a tangent is a straight line that touches a part of the circumference so this is the tangent right and c o b is a straight line c o b is a straight line if c b if c d is parallel to a b whenever you see something like this it's tangent like is parallel so c d which is this is parallel to a b you can see that this sign here is trying to show you that it is parallel that means the lines will never meet right and angle a b e is 40 degrees angle a b e of course the letter at the center carries the angle which is here is 40 degrees find you have to find angle o d e so that's what we're going to find we're going to find angle o d e where is angle o d e angle o d e which is the the one at the center will be what will be this o d e here so we're going to find this so how are we going to find this it's actually very simple but one thing you should not hear is that as we said you have to follow the rules or theories to find it so in finding this one thing you should not hear is that these two parallel lines these lines that are parallel this one here and this is the same thing as saying you have something like this and they are parallel and this line that you can see this line is indirectly same thing as crossing this one can you see and remember that whenever you have an angle here an angle here they are equal we call them alternate angles so it's the same way by saying this 40 here and this c here are alternate angles that means they are equal is that not? so in this case now we're going to say 
angle DCO angle D C O which is here is what 40 degrees and we'll put the theory there so we say angle D C O is equal to 40 degrees Why? we say alternate angles are equal angles are equal so if this place is 40 degrees right this one is 40 degrees remember that we're looking for angle o d e so one thing you should note here also that since this one is coming from the center to the circumference it means that it's a radius and since this one too is coming from the center to the circumference is also a radius so indirectly these ones are equal these lines are equal and when the lines are equal it will give us an isosceles triangle an isosceles triangle is a type of triangle that two sides are equal and the base angles are also equal so since the base angle here is 40 that means angle cdo that's this place is also 40 degrees because base of an isosceles angle so we're going to say angle C D O is also at 40 degrees. Why? We said base or an isosceles triangle are equal. Great. So with this, you know that this place is 40 degrees. So if this one is 40 degrees, we'll be able to get this. How can we get it? This is a triangle. Some of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. So we're going to say angle C O D, which is here, is equal to 180 degrees minus at the 40 plus 40. So in this case, this one is going to be 180 minus 40 plus 40 is 80. So angle C O D will be 180. 180 minus 80 is 100 degrees. So this place is 100 degrees. I've been getting, I've, I've been getting this 100. It's now very possible for us to get what is here why because it is a straight line so some of angles in a straight line is 180 degrees right so now we can get our angle d o e so now we said angle d o e is equals what is equals to 180 minus 100 because if you add 100 plus this angle we're going to get well, supposed to get 180 degrees so what is the theory we said sum of angles angles on the on a straight line on a straight line straight line Now this our angle D O E is equal to 180 minus 100 is 80 degrees. So this place is 80 degrees. So getting this one now will help us to get what is here. Why? Since this one is also from this point to this, that means it is radius. And since it is radius, that means it's like this and that means this and this line are equal it will be a base of an isosceles triangle so if this base of an isosceles triangle this one will be like a and this one too will be a so how can we get these two a's of course if you add the two plus this one plus this 80 degrees we will have 180 degrees sum of angles the triangle right so we're going to say angle O 
D E an angle D E O is equal to what? Is equal to this is going to be eighty plus A plus under A is equal to what? One hundred and eighty degrees. Because you add everything in this triangle, you should be able to have one hundred and eighty degrees. So what is the theory here? We said sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. So that's the theory. So in this case now, we're going to have 80 plus this A plus A, of course, is 2A. Is equal to what? Is equals to 180 degrees, right? So this one here, if we take this to the other side is going to be minus 80 right so we're going to have 2a is equal to 180 minus 80 right so 2a now is going to be 180 minus 80 is 100 so divide both sides by a by 2 right 2 2 so 2 here is 1 2 here is 50 okay so we said therefore A is equal to 50 degrees. Right? So, so if it's 50 degrees, that means this RA here is 50 and this RA here is 50 since it is an isosceles triangle. So, that is our angle ODE. Angle ODE is, we said, therefore, our angle ODE. Right? So that's it. Let's move to the next question. All right, question 12b says ABCD is a parallelogram in which line CD is 7 centimeters, AD is equal to 5 centimeters, and angle ADC is 125 degrees. That means the angle is at letter D. So the first question says we should illustrate the information in a diagram. So even though this is not a construction, but since you are asked to illustrating a diagram then you can actually do that use your ruler draw a straight line with your pencil then mark a point on that straight line towards the end since it is not construction use your protractor straight forward you want to measure 125 degrees so locate 125 degrees on the protractor and mark it which is here then use your ruler to join the two points. Use your pencil to draw a straight line from the two, joining the two points. So remember that this is our D. So this is our D, right? So remember that from the question, line CD is seven centimeters, while line AD is five centimeters. That means line CD is longer than line AD. So now we're going to reuse that's we'll put our line C here. Remember it is what seven centimeters long and it's parallelogram. So, so use our ruler, measure seven centimeters from here, mark it. This is actually seven centimeters. So this is seven centimeters, and we know that from the question that line. AD is 5 centimeters. So we can make this one to be our AD 5 centimeters. Measure from this D. So this one, that means our C will be here. So let's measure 5 centimeters to our A. So our A is going to be here. 5 centimeters, right? Right? So use your pencil and your ruler to connect all the lines draw a straight line measure seven centimeters because it's going to be the same with the line at the bottom so of course seven centimeters will be here so put a point now I use ruler to connect the two points so I draw a line I'll connect the two points 
so this is a parallelogram remember that this is actually 125 degrees so so this is actually the diagram all right you may not waste much time doing this because they do not ask you to consult the eyes just trying to do it so that we'll see how neat it is so you can use your eraser to clean all those parts that so this is our parallelogram right so let's see the other part of the question the other part of the question says we should find correct to one decimal place the area of the parallelogram this is actually very simple so now we should know that there's a formula for calculating the area of a parallelogram whenever an angle is involved so the formula is area is equal to a b sine theta where a is the longest side then b is the shortest side and theta is the angle so now in this case what is our longest side our longest side is seven centimeters so we said this will be seven times our shortest side is five sine theta which is 125 degrees right so 125 degrees so seven times is five is 35 right we have 35 times what is sine 125 sine 125 Is 0 0.819 0 0.819 so time is 35 multiply by 35 times 35 it's equals to 28.67 but the question says we should correct it to one decimal place that is going to be 28.7 right 0.7 in what one decimal place so it's going to be 28 centimeters square because area in one decimal place. So that's it. Let's move to the next question. All right, question 12C. The question says if x is equal to 1 over 2 into 1 minus root 2, close bracket, evaluate. 2x squared minus 2x so how are we going to go about this we know that we have x is equal to 1 over 2 into 1 minus 2 right we should evaluate 2x squared minus 2x so the first thing to do is we're going to solve this equation the the first thing to note here is that we're going to substitute x in this equation. Whenever we see x, we're going to put this value into the equation. So now we're going to say substitute the value of x. So now we know we have 2x squared minus 2x. So it's going to be, so this one will be 2 into what is our x? Our x one in one over two into one minus root two. Remember the x is square, right? So we have two. Then we have minus two. So it's gonna be two into one over two into one minus root two. So we have this. So how are we going to go about this? So we know that this square means we're going to multiply this one in two places. We're going to we're going to put it in two places. So it's going to be two into one over two into one minus root two. Then we have times again another one one over two into one minus root 2 because there are two in number now we have minus 
2 into 1 over 2 into 1 minus root 2 close the bracket so in this case we know that this is same thing as if we balance this one with 1 balance this one with 1 balance this with 1 we're going to have 2 into 1 times the numerator here will be same thing as 1 minus root 2 so we have 1 minus root 2 2 times this denominator is going to be 2 so over 2 of course that's what is going to happen the same thing here is going to be 1 minus root 2 over 2 then we have minus 2 into the same thing 1 minus root 2 over 2 so now in this case we're going to multiply them for this one opening the bracket we're going to have 2 into now this will multiply this right so it's going to be 1 times 1 is of course 1 so we have 1 then we have 1 times minus root 2 is going to be minus root 2. Then we have minus root 2 times 1 is minus root 2. Then we have minus root 2 times minus root 2 is plus root 4, right? Because minus times minus is plus. Right? Then we have over. 2 times 2 is 4. Done? Then we have, I forgot to close this. This one will be minus 2 into 1 more minus root 2 over 2. Alright, solving this further, we're going to have 2 into 1 minus root 2 minus root 2 is going to be 2 root 2 minus 2 root 2. Why? Because we say minus 2 minus 2 is minus 4. So minus cow minus cow, we're going to have minus 2 cows, right? So minus 2 minus 2 is going to be minus 4. Then minus root 2 minus root 2, we're going to have minus 2 of the root 2. Then we have plus, what is root 4? Root 4 is 2. Then over 4 right then we have minus 2 into 1 minus 2 over 2 2 into collect like terms now we're going to have 1 plus 2 minus 2 root 2 over 4 then we have minus 2 into 1 minus root 2 over 2 right so now in this case 1 plus 2 is going to be 3 right then we're going to have 2 into 3 minus 2 root 2 over 4 minus 2 into 1 minus root 2 over 2 All right so in this case we're going to open the bracket if you open the bracket you know you can balance one with one and balance this one two with one so it's going to be two times three is six and have six then two times minus two root two is going to be what is going to be minus 4 root 2 right so over 4 minus 2 times 1 is going to be 2 minus 2 times root 2 is going to be 2 root 2 over 2 so this is going to be something like this Take the LCM of the denominators, 
since it is subtraction the same here of 4 and 2 is 4 so 4 divided by 4 is 1 and 1 times this entire expression is going to be 6 minus 4 and 2 then we have our minus 4 divided by 2 is 2 and 2 times the expression here is going to be 2 into 2 minus 2 root 2 Hello? so opening this bracket we're going to have 6 minus 4 root 2 minus 2 times 2 is 4 then minus times minus is plus so we're going to have plus 2 times root 2 times 2 root 4 is going to be 2 times 2 root 2 is going to be 4 root 2 over 4 right so is there anything that we can collect so yeah we can rearrange so we say rearrange we rearrange by the time we rearrange we're going to have something like this all the numbers these and this will come together so we're going to have 6 minus 4 then we have uh, minus 4 root 2 plus 4 root 2 then over 4 so this is going to be 6 minus 4 is 2 and 4 root 2 minus 4 root 2 plus 4 root 2 of course is going to be 0 right so we're going to be 2 over 4 so 2 here is 1, 2 here is 2, so it's going to be 1 over 2. So this is, after substituting it into this, we're going to get 1 over 2. So that's it, let's move to the next question. Alright, question 13a. The question says, using a ruler and a pair of compasses only, construct I alpha triangle ABC, this is a sign of a uh, triangle right so triangle abc with line ab 7.5 centimeters and line ac 13.5 centimeters where angle abc is equal to 120 degrees so that means the angle is actually pointing at b remember we said that in the alphabet the alphabet that is at the center there is the angle right so we're going to take this so let's give it a try. So we're going to first draw line AB, which is 7.5 centimeters. Use your ruler. Draw line AB. So we draw a straight line. Then we mark our points AB. Remember, it's 7.5 centimeters. So we have zero here. And we have 7.5 is here. We'll label it A and B, right? So this is our line AB, right? Remember it is 7.5 centimeters. So let's put the value is 7.5 centimeters, right? So the next thing, the next thing is line ac is 13 centimeters but before drawing line ac we should note that so the first thing to do is to draw the angle angle 120 at b right because as we said the alphabet at the center b is the angle so let's draw let's construct angle 120 degrees at, at point b so now in constructing angle 120 degrees is very very easy it's just like constructing angle 60 so use your compass <laughs> this is my compass so you can reduce it to any point you want then place it at b at point b then draw an arc as semicycle around to the other side Don't temper with the width of the pair of compass. Make sure your compass is well tied, right? Then, then take the compass to up to this point here. Remember, we're 
constructing angle 120 degrees right remember not to not to temper with the compass cut an arc then carry the compass again place it on the act you you cut cut another act right so this should be our angle 120 degrees but let's draw it a line first use your, using your ruler draw a line connecting b and the second act then draw a straight line so the next thing is to measure it whether it's 120 degrees using the protractor let's check whether it's 120 degrees yeah this is actually 120 degrees you can see it here can you see it here 120 degrees up to this line so this is actually 120 degrees so the next thing now the question says line ac it is actually 13.5 centimeters then how can we get our c we we'll use our ruler now to connect line ac that will give us a point where we're going to label our c so let's go remember it's 13.5 centimeters use your ruler on a place it on a to the line make sure is 13.5 centimeters so use your pencil to indicate the point that will be c bring down the ruler this is our point c now use the ruler now use the ruler now to connect line a c remember we've calculated it to be we've, we've measured it to be 13.5 centimeters use your pencil draw the line So this is line AC. Remember you say it's 13.5 centimeters. So let's level it. So this is our line AC. So let's move to the next part of the question. Question I beta says we should construct a locus and we should name it L1 of a point equidistance from A and B. That means we have to construct a line that is having the same distance from A and B. Indirectly, we are to bisect line AB. We are to construct a line that will divide line AB equally. So, how are we going to do that? Use your compass, place it on A, open it to a specific length, then cut an arc at the bottom and at the top. Cut an arc at the bottom and at the top. The same thing on point B. Put your compass on point B. Remember, you are bisecting A and B. Cut an arc also at the top. And also an arc at the bottom. So after doing this, use your ruler. Then draw a straight line connecting the two arcs. Very, very careful. If not, you will miss it. Then draw a straight line using your pencil, connecting the points. We have successfully bisect line A, B. So we are to name it from the question, we are to name it L1, right? So this is L1, question 13A, I, gamma. Said we should construct also a locus 2, L2, right? Of a point equidistance from B and C, so that means we're going to bisect. So we're going to use the same method. Put your pair of compass on. Put your pair of compass on B. Then strike an arc. On this side, and also strike another arc on this side. Right. Then take the compass to point C strike an arc on this side and also this side right use your ruler to connect the two points the two arcs good you have this right remember that this is locus 2 so this is it even though it's looking very dirty but don't worry we're going to see the end result right finally the 13 a i i says that using n the point of intersection of l 
and L2. That's the two locals where they are meeting. As the center, draw a cycle to pass through point A, B, C. So now we're going to use where the lines meet, which is what? Which is here, right? That will be our our N. So so this will serve as an our N. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to draw down the paper. We're going to draw the paper down because the cycle, I believe the cycle will be out of our board. So now we're going to use your compass. Place the compass at the center, N at the center. Open up the compass to point C. Make sure I touch point C. Then we're going to draw a cycle and your cycle must touch the three point that is point a b c in case your cycle did not touch this point you should know that you are wrong then you have to start again then let's see if our cycle will touch point a b c so let's go wow we did it so you can see it has actually touched line b a b c remember that i forgot to put the angle here 120 degrees right so we got it it's correct so very very simple right all right last question question 13b it says using the method of computing the square Solve four x squared minus four root three x plus two is equal to zero, leaving the answer in soft form. Of course, we know that there are methods of solving uh, quadratic equation, which will include completing the square, factorization method, the formula method, and the graphical method. But the questions here states that we should use completing the square method. So now we have that four x squared. Minus 4 root 3x plus 2 is equal to 0. So now the next thing is to. So we'll move these two to the other side, right? That's the collecting light terms. So we'll do that. We have that 4x squared minus 4 root 3x is equal to now will be what minus 2. So the next thing to do is we are going to divide all 2 by the coefficient of this x here so that we'll make it to be the coefficient to be 1. So we'll divide all 2 by 1. By 4 because that's the coefficient of that x, right? So we're going to have 4x squared minus 4 root 3x is equal to minus 2. So we divide by 4, divide by 4, and then divide by 4. We're going to divide all 2 by 4. We know that 4 here will go 4. And this 4 here will cancel this 4, right? Then 4 here is then 2 here is 1, 2 here is 2. Is that not? So now we'll be left with x squared minus root 3x is equals to minus 1 over 2. Right? So this is what we're having. So the next thing is to take, of course, we know that quadratic equation is usually in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c so in the next step is to carry this bx and get the half right and take the square because it's completing the square we will take the half of the b which is this right take the half then we square it so in this case so the half of we're going to say so let's get the half of root 2 so we, have, we say half of root the half of root 3 is going to be 1 over 2 times 
tree. So this one is going to be what? Balance this with one. We're going to have root three over two. So this is the half of root three. Then we'll take the square. Right? We'll take the square. So this is what we're going to use. So in this case, um, we have root three over two square. So now in this case, we're going to say x square minus instead of x square minus root 3x then we have we add this the half which is root 3 put it in the bracket we have remember it's minus root 3 over 2 square right now it's equal to add the same thing here minus 1 over 2 then we have minus root 3 over 2 squared. So whatever you do to the left hand side, you have to do it to the right hand side. So in this case now, since it is com in this case now, since it is completing the square, we are going to pick only those with square on the left hand side. So that means we are going to only carry this x and this because they are though they are the only ones with square on the left hand side so doing that so we're going to have pick it is going to be x then we have minus root 3 over 2 remember is all of them having square so we square all of them at the same time can you see so instead of putting the square differently you can put it at the same time so this is equal to now forget about this because as we said, we only need the square on the left hand side. Those with square. So we have minus 1 over 2. So now this is. You square these ones. We are not going to do it like the way you did the other one. So we're going to say. Remember that whenever you take. So in this case, um, you're going to square this root 3. And whenever you take the square of a negative value, it will always be positive. So now that, is, that means this place automatically will be positive. Why? Because root 3 square is going to be root 9, right? So we're going to have root 9 over root 2. So 2 square, right? The denominator will be 4. So we have 4. Can you see? So what are we going to do next? We're going to take the LCM of the right hand side. So of course the LCM is 4. So 4 divided by 2 is 2. And 2 times is minus 1 is minus 2. Then plus 4 divided by 4 is now the next thing we'll have x minus root 3 over 2 all squared is equal to minus 1 over 2 plus what is root 9? Root 9 is 3 and over 4. Right? So now we'll take the LCM of the left of the right hand side. So the LCM of 2 and 4 is 4. Then 4 divided by 2 is 2. 2 times is minus 1 is minus 2. Plus 4 divided by 4 is 1. And 1 times is 3 is 3. Right? So in this case, remember that we have x minus root 3 over 2. All square is equal to this. So. In this case, we're going to have. In this case, we're going to have x minus root three over two squared is equal to minus two plus three. 
So minus 2 plus 3 is 1. So we have 1 over 1 over 4, right? So next thing is what are we going to do? We will actually take the square root of both sides. So So if you take the square root of both sides, it's going to remove this square, right? So take the square root of both sides. And when you take the square root of both sides, we know that this will cancel the square root, right? The square will cancel the square root. And we'll be having something like this. X minus root 3 over 2 is equal to plus minus, right? The square root of 1 is 1 and the square root of 4 is 2. So of course, of course, we're going to balance this with 1. Take the LCM of the entire equation. So, so what I'm going to do next, of course, we're going to collect light terms. If you collect light terms, this one here will move to the other side. And once it moves, it will change to positive, right? So we're going to have x equals to root 3 over 2 plus minus now 1 over 2 so next what we're going to do of course you know that the denominators are the same so what we're going to do we add and subtract we add and subtract the numerator because whenever you're dealing with a fraction and the denominators are the same you just if it's addition you just add the numerators and if it's subtraction you just subtract the numerators so in this case we're going to have something like this x is equal to root 3 plus plus minus 1 over 2 simple so huh so our x now is going to be either x is equal to root 3 plus 1 over 2 or x is equal to root 3 minus 1 over 2 Remember the question says we should leave our answer in short form. So we can say therefore. Say so therefore. X is equal to root three plus one over two. Or root three minus one over two. So this is the answer in short form. So all right all right if you have been following congratulations you've come to the end of the solution of the 2020 mathematics yek questions i believe with this now you've learned a lot try to explore more questions remember that learning doesn't stop here right so the at least five years you will understand better and you will have good you you'll be confident enough to press any question that may come your way so remember if you want to support this channel don't forget to subscribe like share and subscribe thanks for watching see you in the next video